Distinguished President Halonen, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my great pleasure to, to chair this final session of, of today's seminar. Uh, I'm Teja Tilikainen, the director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. On behalf of, of my institute, also welcome to all the speakers and participants of today's highly interesting seminar. The topic of this uh, session will be the changing global uh, power balance. So we will uh, step by step come closer to today's circumstances uh, with respect to, to the state of affairs in the, in the global order and, and the setup the big power relationships in, in our contemporary era. Uh, in this uh, session, we will have uh, five speakers. Uh, we take all the presentations. Uh, if, if the presentations are somewhat shorter than, than half an hour each, there is room for, for some questions and comments from the audience uh, already before the final panel, which then uh, will be the, the place for, for a final discussion about today's topics. We will have all the panelists uh, with us in the final, final panel after this session. Uh, I will uh, introduce the speakers one by one. Our first speaker is, is uh, Professor Louis Clerc from the University of Turku. He's the professor of political history there. Uh, he's a historian of international uh, relations, public diplomacy, and also uh, hi a history of European integration uh, belongs to his fields of expertise. He uh, has published extensively on, on these topics. He also actively takes part in, in public uh, debate about uh, these issues belonging to his field of expertise. And now Professor Louis Clerc will uh, talk about the winners of the Second World War uh, after the war, so the period of Cold War and uh, so the, the shift from the, from the Second World War to the Cold War system. So, Louis, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much to, for inviting me to this conference. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to, to speak in this room where I've done research many times. Uh, so what I want to do during the next 30 minutes, I want to give you a general reflection a synthesis on the uh, circumstances of the change in international relations be, that uh, brought us from World War II, the alliance, uh, to what we used to call the Cold War. It is a bipolar system characterized by two hegemons, the USSR and uh, the United States. I will mostly concentrate on Europe, I will mostly concentrate on states, and I will mostly concentrate on either great powers or former great powers. So I have to apologize for not talking about small states or small nations. So it's going to be mostly a little jog through uh, things that you should all more or less no. So do take, do take it as an occasion to check your emails or rest your eyes. I won't, I won't bother. So let's start with three movies. Uh, in the last movie of his wartime trilogy, Germany Year Zero, uh, finished in 1948, the Italian filmmaker Roberto Rossellini draws a cruel portrait of the immediate post-war period in Germany. It's the portrait of an occupied and dilapidated Berlin where men, women, and children suffer from hunger and uh, a loss of directions in their lives. In the end of the movie, the camera follows Edmund, a boy, as he wanders in the ruins of the city and eventually kills himself, leaving his sister, Eva, to face the music uh, amongst the wreckage of their city and country. At the same time, almost the same year, uh, the movie A Foreign Affair by Billy Wilder uh, came up and gave us a completely different picture of Germany. The movie is a romantic comedy set in 1945 Berlin with a star cast, Marlene Dietrich as the mysterious femme fatale, Jean Arthur as the naive American congresswoman. Uh, there's a cynical, a serious tone to the movie, but the movie is dominated by one feeling. Uh, in 1945 Europe, Americans are in charge and corrupt Europeans have passed their prime. 
And as the third movie in the 1950s, finally, from another quarter, and as it seems, almost another century, uh, the voice dubbing of Sergei Eisenstein, Battleship Potemkin, was uh, done anew, was restored. The movie got a new score, and it went on to be named the greatest film of all times in the uh, Brussels World Fair of 1958. I'm sure you remember Battleship Potemkin, where at the end, the um, rebelled sailors sailed with the red flag on through the Tsarist fleet. So the message for international relations of a quick comparison between these movies is very clear. In 1945, with the Europe uh, rise, the US rise, the Soviet Union. Clogged in the ruins of two worlds while the old states of Europe had been brought down from their pedestals and in their stead came two countries, the US and Soviet Russia. So what happened to these victors of the war? First of all, these victors stood in the middle of a continent that had been destroyed on many levels, physical, uh, financial, economic, and intellectual. The destructions were first physical. I just spent a year in Hamburg in the Helmut Schmidt University as, a, as an invited professor, and I visited the town and many museums, amongst them one where you have an exhibition on Hamburg in 1945. Uh, where you see a city that is basically a, a moon landscape entirely leveled by uh, mostly British bombings. I'm sorry, I'm just going to try to keep this thing going. Okay. So, the destruction has been uh, visited not only on France, on Germany, on Italy, on the west of the Soviet Union, on Greece. Uh, but also uh, in Britain during the Blitz and the, with the consequences of the war. Uh, you might know John Lydon, you might probably know him as under another name, Johnny Rotten, the singer of a small band called the Sex Pistols. In his biography, he describes 1940s, 1950s, Britain as a rather squalid place, an entire country unmoored. Uh, robbed of its grandeur by the war effort, in which kids like Lyndon get spinal meningitis from drinking tap water. So it's a continent that has been destroyed physically. It's a continent that is financially and economically also completely disorganized. Germany had, been, had disappeared as a market and as a provider. There's hunger, there's uh, strikes, uh, a lack of hard currency, a lack of manufactured goods, a lack of food in the countries. And the unrest is also intellectual. Uh, Europeans themselves had made a mockery of European values, this, the mass violence that was, uh, before 1917, reserved to uh, colonial subjects had been visited upon Europeans uh, with devastating consequences. So Europe in 1945 is the dark continent that Mark Mazover has written about. It's a, con it's a continent that had lost its appeal and its voice to the world. Oddly enough, though, uh, powerless and irrelevant as it had become, uh, Europe was still the battlefield of choice for these two countries, these two hegemons that, we've, that I'm going to describe. It's one of the main foci of the, of the Cold War. Uh, the setting of the Cold War will artificially emphasize the importance of France and the United Kingdom as allies to the US of Eastern Europe as a buffer to Soviet Russia, and of Berlin as the focus of many crises during the, uh, the years of the Cold War. So for the main countries of this ravaged continent, uh, France, the United Kingdom, Italy, uh, Germany, Western Germany, the, the, let's say the, the former great powers, there would be four dimensions that would come to determine their international position after 1945. First of all, the ideological fight between East and West that will cut not only in between those countries, but also inside those countries with the emergence of uh, very strong communist parties after the, after the war. Decolonization would be the second big structure. First the UK, then until 1962 and through increasingly bitter uh, struggles, France, both will let go of their colonial empire. Decolonization would be a, a geopolitical development of major consequences. Then European integration at all level, uh, starting with the Council of Europe, NATO, etc., and then to the European communities. 
Tony Youth writes that the programs of European integration were attempts at providing European solutions to European problems, uh, especially the problem of Germany, what to do with Germany. So the Europeans pushed by the United States in Western Europe tried to find solutions to that. European states endured, and thus they were capable to engage in cooperation. They endured, and they were, as Alan Millward has put together, as, as put forward, they endured and they were strengthened by their situation in the 1950s. And thus another uh, a fourth structure is the creation of uh, welfare state provisions in these countries. The 1950s, the 1960s sees the main uh, countries of Europe develop welfare state provisions that will make, in again Tony Hughes' terms, uh, Europe into the welfare continent and draw a symbolic line between the US and Western Europe. Finally, the new qualitative situation emerging from the operation of nuclear power. Nuclear weapons were a qualitative change, not a quantitative change. It wasn't just a better weapon like rifles or guns, but it was a qualitative weapon, the uh, act of fiat by which you destroy lives on a, an industrial square. So the atomic bomb was not a weapon of the battlefield, but a deterrent, a qualitative weapon which will change the, uh, the relation that uh, countries will have to this. So what, this former, what about these former great powers? What did they become? Well, for France and Britain, we could use the concept of middle power. It's been created by William Lyon Mackenzie King and Louis Saint Laurent about Canada, a country that is not a great power, but retains elements of influence in the world. The idea has been used for France. Uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, for example, called in 2009 France a middle-sized great power that retains global interests and instruments to act globally. Overseas territory, powerful trade and economic presence, active diplomacy, good military capabilities. In 2016, you had about 8,000 French soldiers abroad. Cultural aspects, soft power, intellectual, artistic attraction, etc., etc., and the nuclear power the deterrent. So this has been a process of downsizing the power of these countries from great powers to middle-sized powers. And it's been a long unraveling for countries like France and Britain. For France, the First World War, uh, then the defeat of the country at the end of the German army in 1940, then after that, uh, decolonization, 1954, Dien Bien Phu, 1956, uh, the Suez disaster. All these were steps on the way from being a great power to becoming a middle-sized power. For Britain, the realization of this new status was muddled, made more difficult by the victory in the war, in the Second World War. But uh, uh, decolonization, Suez as well, and in 1961, the obligation to, the decision to apply for uh, membership in the European communities uh, also were steps toward realizing the country's new status. To some extent, uh, the Brexit debate at the moment is still uh, a part of this coming to terms with the position of, of Britain, the new position of Britain in the world after the Second World War. So, if these pre-war European powers, major European powers, did not disappear out uh, of view, they're all changed, even if their expectations, as I mentioned with the, the Brexit uh, thing, their expectations about themselves did not change immediately. But of course, uh, the main story in 1945 is the relations between the Soviet Union and the United States. How do we come from the alliance of the wartime to a, uh, to a Cold War? Let's keep with movies. Uh, if one would learn history essentially through Oliver Stone's movies, uh, one would be pushed to think that the Cold War is just one more dreadful consequence of school bullying. Uh, Stone has a documentary series that came out in, in uh, 2012, The Untold History of the United States. It's very short on history, it's even shorter on untold history. Uh, Harry Truman, the president of the US at the end of the war, is depicted as a virulent racist, mentally unfit for office, and suffering from gender confusion and bad self-esteem. Stone narrates how the president was bullied as a kid, called Four Eyes, because of his very heavy 
glasses, and how his mother would comfort him by telling him that he was meant to be a girl anyway. So the series implies uh, Truman dropped the atomic bombs on Japan and bullied Stalin in order to appear as a strong guy. That's what Stone puts in his movies. On the other hand, Stalin uh, cuts a, a dashing, manly, stern, heroic figure uh, in these movies. He's a down-to-earth character, uh, busy beating the Germans and, and, uh, and leading parades, not quite unlike Vladimir Putin in the, in the um, interview that Stone has realized with the, with the Russian president recently. So, of course, the point of Stone is that uh, since uh, the United States started the war in Vietnam and then in Iraq, of course, they must have started the Cold War as well. If you look at that from a, a different angle, uh, let's say a more scientific angle, the beginning of the Cold War appears as a slow process of escalation uh, between former allies. There's an important point here that I want, I want to make, and I take it from uh, a researcher called uh, Oda Nevestat, and before him, uh, Walter Lafiber in America, Russia, and the Cold War, published in 1972, who both, and especially Vestad as a global historian, emphasized the importance of the long-term view, the long-term the, the long consequences. One can make the argument that uh, through misunderstandings and problems, the two great powers sort of sleepwalked into the Cold War, like for Christopher Clark, the, the states of Europe sleepwalked into the, the First World War. But after the first years, and especially after the death of Stalin, uh, the continuation on the long term of the Cold War cannot be explained in any other ways than what Vestad and Lafiber put together. Uh, they emphasized that the US and the USSR were rising powers since the 19th century, powers that were not only in their interests, but also in their views of the world, largely incompatible, and were bound to clash on the long term. Competition, at least of some sort, was inevitable for Lafiber, set within the frame of long-term forces. So how do we get there? Uh, how do we get to Berlin? How do we get to, to the Cold War? If we continue to the, with the insights of, of Vestad and Lafiber, the US and the USSR were merely accidental allies in a war that Japan and Germany pushed, forced on them. In 1941, in a speech that Vestad picks in his book, uh, Churchill said already that if he disliked Stalin as much as he disliked Hitler, uh, times were dire and the USSR had to be taken on board. Uh, Stalin, on the other hand, distrusted his allies mostly, but the aid was absolutely essential. The USSR needed funds, uh, food, etc., etc. So what we have less than grand schemes and strategic plans to take over Europe or to spread communism, we have leaders in two, in three countries, the US, the USSR, and uh, Britain, sort of bumbling forward, uh, acting on their unspoken, on the basis of their unspoken assumptions, the representations of others and themselves. Stalin saw things like he had basically always seen them. Uh, peace and security was essential to the USSR. The USSR was under threat. Uh, international relations were a zero-sum game where you took something and if you had to give something and it was taken from you, there was no, uh, there was no general sense of, of cooperation. In the territories he occupied in Eastern Europe, he might reproducing the systems he thought the most stable, strong authoritarian regimes uh, led by communist parties and under the gaze of the Red Army. The constitution of a buffer of states in Eastern Europe was uh, prominent. And as Sabine Dula in France, for example, has emphasized in her writings about Soviet diplomats after 1945, Stalin was also wary of Western powers. He did not trust the Western powers he did not seek compromises of co of Europe, but guarantees, compensation for the efforts that the Soviet Union had put in the war. And he was worried of being played or tricked by the West. On the other hand, the US saw themselves as the natural leader of this new world, the main country in the world. Truman became president at the death of uh, Roosevelt, and the situation in the world made him nervous 
he brooded about that. He became concerned about what would happen in Eastern Europe, in the Balkans, and especially how would the US live up to their promise to the world, live up to, the, to their new uh, position. There was plenty of articles and publications about the US taking the mantle of the British Empire. In Britain, as well, uh, a new leadership with Clement Attlee as Prime Minister and Zbivin as Foreign Minister, both Labour politicians, uh, came that was extremely uh, defiant and, and worried about what uh, the USSR would, would do. So it's a series of escalation moves after that from uh, the, the, the civil war in Greece and to, from the civil war in Greece to the Marshall Plan to etc. Cetera, et cetera, something you know very well, sort of sleepwalking into the Cold War, as I, I would call that. George Kennan in 1946 formulated a doctrine, containment, which seemed to offer a good policy alternative for a US leadership that really didn't quite know how to, how to make sense of this new world. So at the beginning of 1948, the Cold War system was in place, mostly due to the failure on both sides to disarm distrust and to find ways to channel contacts. So there are still two things to my, uh, to my presentation. One is uh, to stop a moment on John Gaddis, John Lewis Gaddis, a summary of the reasons of the Cold War. American policy changed in 1945 first. It became more assertive, it became more sure, of itself, like what Billy Wilder's movie would say. It became uh, people discovering a new world, but nonetheless thinking that, that they're in charge. And it's eventually bumped into the Soviet Union. The US misread Soviet intentions. That's Gaddis here speaking. Taking those for a grand scheme of continental invasion, Gaddis writes that Washington mistook Stalin's determination to ensure Russian security through spheres of influence for a renewed effort to spread communism. Misunderstanding. Then uh, the US and Soviet ideologies and views on basically anything from international trade to the good society and uh, to the position of individuals in uh, democratic systems to democracy itself uh, were largely incompatible. Michael Berry, a researcher in my university actually, writes that foreign policy is the resolution of domestic tensions on the international stage, which I think makes quite a lot of sense if we think of, of the beginning of the Cold War and the slow escalation between these two powers. And finally, and that's something as a researcher interested in, in uh, diplomatic relations, not international relations, but diplomatic relations, I'm particularly interested in that. This distrust, these problems were compounded by uh, difficult interpersonal relations between uh, US and Soviet diplomats and between the leaderships of the, of the two countries. That's again uh, Sabine Dulin, but also Gaddis who emphasized the difficulties of Atlee, of Truman, and of Stalin to come eye to eye, to trust each other and to find common solutions to especially Europe's problems. So now to, to finish this presentation, uh, in his book, Post-War, again, Tony Yud writes that he decided to write his book in 1989, seeing how the Soviet Union was unraveling. A new order was coming about, and he felt the need to come back to such past momentous changes in order to make sense of this new change. And do we have now the same situation? Can we get anything from the beginning of the Cold War in order to understand the place uh, we're going to and the place we're living in? Uh, I came across an interesting thread on Twitter, the social media uh, network, written by the British journalist Ben Judah, where he presents his oncoming new book on the Indian subcontinent. And he writes, emphasizes the complete switch of logic one has to experience when looking at the world through uh, the words and through the eyes of the people living there. People from whom Dubai is a major cultural and lifestyle center, uh, Paris an open air museum, a Europe a closed, irrelevant, but fairly well-off uh, fortress, the US a retiring great power, China and India the main titans of the coming world, and Russia an irrelevance except for small countries in Eastern Europe that, to be frank, nobody really cares about. 
So our fights, our historical debates, our attachment to human rights, to democracy makes no sense to uh, the leadership of Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, even India. So there's a new architecture that's emerging, and that's the conclusion of, of Judah, to which I can very well uh, associate myself. There's a new architecture coming, but we have still no idea what it is. It's a multipolar world with strong axes between uh, specific places, uh, fluidity and ubiquity along cultural, economic, and linguistic lines. The Western model is set into question, criticized and uh, uh, used, and at the same time criticized by new actors. Environmental concerns are foremost in this new world. And nobody quite knows whose world is this to shape. We don't have anymore, like in 1945, the feeling that there are big hands managing this world. So Gadis, again, wrote that the only thing history can teach us is that we don't know much and we always get surprised. So that's what I want to, to end on. And on another point that maybe if we are looking at the things we are looking at most intently, uh, great power relations, is maybe not anymore what matters the most in this world where we're living in. Technology, environmental destruction, consumerism, urbanization, uh, or relations to science, the democracy as a way of organizing societies, maybe these are, as historical trends, uh, more important objects of studies to under understand our own predicament than the way great powers worked in the past. So I leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Louis Clerc. I think you expressed the thinking of, of many of us when you said that we realized that there is a change or a transition going on, but in the middle of this change or transition, it's very difficult for us to see where it leads to or even to, to explain the, the whole, whole package of, of, of change. So this is certainly something that we will get back to later on. Uh, uh, but now we will take the next step from the Cold War era to the immediate post-Cold Cold War era. Uh, uh, the title of, of, of our next presentation uh, is The breakdown of, breakdown of the Soviet Union and the Rise of the New Russia. Uh, our next speaker will be Professor Alexei Gusev from Moscow uh, Lomonosov State University. Professor Gusev is a, is a well-known expert of uh, of Russian history, political history, and social history, uh, an author of, of, of several books and, uh, and professor uh, of, of uh, political, pol professor history, of history. <laughs> the floor is yours. Welcome. Your Excellences, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the breakdown of the Union of uh, Soviet Socialist Republics in 1991 has been certainly one of the most crucial events in the history of the 20th century, uh, events that profoundly affected the course of contemporary history. It radically changed uh, global geopolitical situation in the sense that one of the two world's superpowers ceased to exist and the new 15 independent states, including the Russian Federation, appeared as subjects of uh, international law and actors of world politics. Uh, this historic event continues to stand in the uh, center of public and academic debates its causes, nature, and consequences constitute a subject of numerous works of researchers and politicians who suggest various and often conflicting assessments, um, explanations of the Soviet Union's demise. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin in 2005 called a disintegration of the USSR uh, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the century. Later, he gave his uh, own interpretations of the causes of this uh, geopolitical catastrophe, factors that led to it. And among these factors, he mentioned uh, 
ineffective uh, economic and social policies of Soviet rulers, but also the very principle of organization of the Soviet Union, the basic principle. Uh, organization of Union as an association of national republics with equal rights, including a right of secession from the Union. Uh, this basic uh, principle introduced by Lenin, uh, on which Soviet Union was founded in 1922, uh, was called by Putin a time bomb placed under our state. And in 1991, this bomb finally exploded. Indeed, a right to secede from the Union codified in the Article 72 of the Russian Constitution, or the Soviet, I'm sorry, Constitution, was used in 1990 and 1991 by various republics to legalize their break from the USSR. However, it was not the first time when uh, the composite state built around Russia disintegrated. For the first time, it happened in... Uh, following the 1917 revolution. So neither a form uh, of national republics nor a right to secede existed in that time. Russia was a unitary state with no internal national administrative division, with an exception of Finland autonomy. But this did not prevent it from a break up along national lines. In 1917 and 1918, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and of course Finland proclaimed their independence. And it was exactly a recognition of their national statehood in principle uh, that helped Bolsheviks later to bring most of these uh, nations together in a common state called the USSR. Thus, a form of state as a union of national republic, republics hardly was just a mistaken choice made by Lenin. Rather, it was a logical result of policy aimed at reintegration of peoples that lived on the territory of the former Russian Empire. So, both unitary Russian Empire and formerly federal Soviet Union came to the same end, disintegration. Therefore, this outcome did not follow from the particular type of state structure. Its causes have to be found somewhere else. I would argue that the final breakdown of the USSR can be understood in the context of social modernization, a long historical process of transition to industrial economy with corresponding structure of society, democratic political institutions, and modern culture. This objective process began in Russia in the middle of 19th century and manifested itself in a series of revolutions, from the ones of 1905 and 1917 to the events of the late 1980s and early 1990s, which had a revolutionary character too. All these popular revolutions aimed at destruction of authoritarian regimes and establishment of democratic systems adequate to the needs of economic development and aspirations of people as citizens. An important aspect of democratization and modernization in general has been a process of self-determination of nations. Everywhere, not just in Russia, as such social scientists as, as Gellner, Anderson, and Black uh, <clears throat> point out, uh, modernization included dismantling of multinational empires and transition to national states. Cyril Black, uh, one of the specialists on these problems, call it a crucial dimension of political modernization. The Soviet Union, uh, though formerly a federation of national republics, was essentially, like a pre-revolutionary Russia, a formation of imperial type. If following Ronald Sunni, we understand empire as a composite state in which a metropole dominates a periphery to the disadvantage of periphery. The metropole here not need to be defined 
ethnically or geographically. Rather, it is the ruling institution. In the pre-revolutionary Russian Empire, its role was played by imperial family and upper layers of uh, landed gentry and bureaucracy. In Soviet Union, the same role was played by the upper layers of the communist ruling elite or nomenclatura. The distinctive characteristic of empire, according to another renowned specialist on this subject, Shmuel Eisenstadt, is that this metropole or center constitutes an autonomous entity. The USSR was born as a result of Bolsheviks' victory in the civil war and extension of their power to the most part of the former Russian Empire's territory. At first, uh, Soviet Union included four republics, Russia, Ukraine, Belarusia, and Transcaucasian Republic. After internal delimitation of 1920s and 1930s and annexation of the Baltic states in 1940, the, member of republics, the number of republics grew. Uh, by the 1980s, the USSR consisted of 15 republics. According to nominal Soviet constitution, uh, they were subjects of federation, independent in their internal affairs. Uh, but in fact, the Soviet Union was a highly centralized, unitarian state with concentration of all powers in the center in Moscow. The backbone of the, communist, of the Soviet system, the Communist Party, even formally, even on, on paper, did not have federal character. Uh, according to the Communist Party Statute, uh, the central organs of so-called national communist parties in non-Russian republics had no more powers and authority than each of more than 40 regional party committees of the Russian Republic and were in the same way subordinated to the Central Committee in Moscow. Economy in the Union Republics was managed in the same bureaucratic centralized manner according to plan set by the central organs in Moscow. And only 6% of the um, country's industry was regulated on the Republican level. Though official Communist Party documents declared that the national question in the USSR had been solved and new historical collectivity, the Soviet people, had been formed, the reality was quite different. The sentiments of national dissatisfaction developed in the non-Russian republics, where the imperial center was often identified with Russia and Russians as dominant nation. And this was understandable in a situation where Russians constituted a majority in the central government and CPSU uh, bodies and monopolized several key positions uh, in um, every republic such as a secondary secretary in every Republican Communist Party responsible for cadres, uh, like um, heads of uh, um, uh, local security services, services in republics or commanders of regional military districts. Local national languages in the republics was seen as discriminated in favor of Russian in the administrative and educational spheres. Besides that, there were tensions between some non-Russian nationalities themselves. For instance, in Nagorny Karabakh region, where the Amer Armenian population uh, <clears throat> was in the majority, but this region was um, incorporated in Azerbaijan Republic in the 1920s. Uh, or contradictions between Kyrgyzes and Uzbeks in Central Asia over belonging of uh, deficit agricultural lands and water su supplies. Such discontents manifested themselves from time to time in national disturbances that took place in Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzia, Uzbekistan, and Baltic republics in the period from the 1950s to 1980s. 
The government uh, in Moscow managed to suppress these disturbances, but they were dangerous symptoms of the growing internal contradictions in Soviet empire. These late, latent problems became visible when Mikhail Gorbachev initiated reform in the USSR known as Perestroika in 1985. When the policy of changes and correction of the past mistakes was declared, it immediately provoked a reaction from below. Already in December 1986, thousands of Kazakhs, mostly youth, came out on the streets of Kazakhstan Republic's capital, Almata, protesting against nomination of the ethnic Russian Gennady Kolbin as the first secretary of Republican Communist Party Central Committee. They demand, and you can see the slogan here, was Kazakh people need their own leader, not a Russian sent from Moscow, but the local Kazakh. In clashes with police in Almaty at that time, uh, more than 1,000 people were injured, several hundreds were arrested. And the center had to yield by replacing Kolbin by the ethnic Kazakh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who later became a president of Kazakhstan and is still ruling this republic now. By the end of 1980s, three main areas of national tensions appeared on the USSR's territory. First, Baltic republics, second, South Caucasian republics, and uh, third, Central Asia. In uh, Baltic region, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, mass of people demonstrated demanding official condemnation of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939, which led to incorporation of these uh, republics into the Soviet Union. And they also put forward uh, slogans of the republic's economic independence and self-government. In South Caucasus, uh, Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh developed, taking a form of bloody confrontation, the real war. You can see pictures from this conflict. In Georgia, also the uh, South Caucasus, a movement for independence from the center was growing alongside with a conflict with Abkhaz ethnic majority in Georgia, it's a minority in Georgia itself. In Central Asia, Clashes between Uzbeks on one hand and Kyrgyzs and Meshetians on the other hand took place. By 1991, as a result of the inter-ethnic conflicts, about 1,000 people died and several hundred thousands became refugees. As liberalization of the Soviet system progressed in the course of perestroika, the imperial center weakened and its ability to control periphery diminished. Under these conditions, all kind of fr old, frozen, inter-ethnic conflicts rooting in the time of pre-revolutionary Russia or in Stalin's time, like Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict or Georgian-Abkhazian conflict, all this conflict broke out again. But the most important factor leading to the disintegration of the USSR was a movement for political self-determination of republics. This movement had an expression at two levels, both at the level of masses and at the level of republican elites. Masses demand, demanded radical democratic changes and putting an end to the situation where when all important decisions were taken uh, not in republics themselves, but in the Moscow center. They held the center responsible for aggravating social economic crisis and ecological troubles and disasters, such as a catastrophe at Chernobyl atomic power plant in Ukraine in 1986, or death of the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan, or pollution caused by uh, phosphorate production in Estonia. From 1988, mass opposition movements, often called Popular France, began to form first in Baltic republics, then in South Caucasus and in other regions. Soon they adopted slogans of complete state sovereignty of their republics. 
Republican administrative elites on their part were interested in redistribution of power and authorities from the imperial center to the republics. Such redistribution would have strengthened their positions and raised their status. Uh, at the 19th All Union CPSU conference in the same 1990, uh, 1988, some of the Republican leaders of non Russian republics uh, spoke openly denouncing diktat of central government bodies and advocated decentralization. And at the same year, parliaments of Soviet republics began to proclaim their sovereignty by adopting special declarations. That meant proclamations of primacy of the republican laws over the laws of the Union, uh, Soviet Union as a whole. The first such declaration had been passed by Estonian parliament in November 1988, and in 1989 the same had been done by Lithuania, Latvia, and Azerbaijan, and then by all other republics. In 1990, centrifugal process in the USSR entered a next phase. New Republican parliaments, elected on the basis of the new, much more democratic laws, began to realize their understanding of sovereignty in practice by entering into the war of laws with the Union Center. And four republics, three Baltic ones and Armenia, went much further and proclaimed restoration of their full state independence and secession from the USSR. The center on its part declared such decision illegal. But it was Russia that had to play a crucial central role in the disintegration of the USSR. Uh, the Russian Republic, uh, the main element of the Soviet Union with most numerous population, had been considered an elder brother in the family of 15 Soviet republics and was considered the chief founder of the USSR. This was even reflected in the official Soviet anthem approved by Stalin. Though, as I said earlier, the Russian Republic was not a metropole of the empire itself, it was seen by the ruling elite as a pillar of central union authorities. Since it had not its own Russian Communist Party, the mechanisms of government of the Soviet Union and of its, its biggest republic were to a large extent fused. But in 1990, the Russian Federation appeared as an autonomous political subject and immediately confronted the Union Center. This happened following March 1990 elections to the Congress of Popu People's Deputies, a body that, that was designed to make principal political decisions and form a standing Russian parliament, the Supreme Soviet. Voting brought success to the Democratic Russia movement that stood in opposition to the Communist Party, advocating further democratic reforms and fast transition from the statist command economy to a full-fledged market. <clears throat> its program included also a demand of state sovereignty of Russia, the distribution of power to Russian Republic from the center. The democratic Russia's informal leader was Boris Yeltsin, a prominent politician, a former member of the top communist nomenclatura, who in the late 1980s challenged Mikhail Gorbachev and went over to democratic opposition camp. In June 1990, Congress of People Deputies elected Yeltsin ahead of the Supreme Soviet of Russia. And the same Congress on the 20th of June 1990 adopted the Declaration on State Sovereignty of Russia, prepared by Democratic Russia's deputies. This day, 20th of June, uh, later become, became and is now an official holiday in our country, a day of Russia because it, it is seen as a moment when the new Russian statehood was born. After that, the new government of Russian Republic was formed by the Supreme Soviet. On the basis of declaration of sovereignty, you see the moment when they discussed this declaration in June 1990, uh, the new government uh, declared all national resources in Russia its own property, and took control over enterprises and organizations on its territory. 
Russia also proposed a plan of economic reform for the USSR in general, uh, which has become to know, to known as a 500 days program. This program envisaged an economic uh, union between republics, but avoided mentioning central government of the USSR. As uh, this and other documents demonstrated, Russia at that time already preferred to develop direct relations with other republics and had little interest in maintaining the imperial center at all. In this situation, the metropole of the USSR, represented by the bureaucracy of the central government bodies and military industrial complex, found itself in growing isolation. The central government tried to annul republican laws that contradicted in its interest and effectively rejected the 500 days program, the economic program of the Russian government. Instead, the central Soviet government pursued, without any consultations with republics, its own economic policy of administrative price rises and exchange of paper money that provoked popular discontent and protest. In January 1991, central power-wielding agencies attempted military coups, coup d'etats in Lithuania and Latvia, to bring them back under control of the center. These attempts failed, but more than 20 people were killed and several hundred injured. This led to an outburst of indignation throughout the Union and provoked a massive wave of protests. On 20th January 1991, at an unprecedented by scale demonstration in Moscow, about 500,000 people showed their solidarity with Baltic republics, protested against attempts to suppress national self-determination by force, and demanded resignation of the Central Union government. You see here the events in Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, and the reaction, the biggest demonstration in Russian history, I think, that January of 1991. In order to size the initiative, the center initiated in March 1991, an all-union referendum on the future of the USSR. Voters had to answer the question if they agree with continuation of the USSR as a renovated union of sovereign republics. About 70% of voters said yes, but the fact that six republics did not participate in the referendum, these six republics, three Baltic states, Georgia, Armenia, and Moldova, this abstention showed how far the process of union's disintegration went by that time. The referendum could not prevent the further development of the anti-center movement in the republics. In March 1991, a massive minor strike began in Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. It was soon joined by workers of steel, machine building, and other industries. Strikers demanded resignation of President Gorbachev and Soviet Union and trans transfer all the state power to sovereign republics and their coordinative organ called Council of Federation. And under growing pressure from below, and particularly the workers' movement, Gorbachev in April 1991 agreed to radically reform the Soviet Union by adopting a new Union Treaty that would have to reflect profound redistribution of power and authorities from the center to Republican level. Such treaty had been elaborated by August 1991 in a series of consultations between uh, President of the Soviet Union and heads of republics. But the top bureaucracy of the center proved unwilling to accept such diminishing of its role. In August 1991, Heads of several central ministers, including power wielding bloc, attempted a coup d'etat in Moscow to oust Gorbachev and prevent the new Union Treaty from coming into effect. However, this August coup failed, faced by an active resistance from the Russian authorities and from below. As a result, uh, the center whose leading functions uh, were put behind the bars as uh, instigators of the coup, 
lost any remnants of real control over the union's territory. Central legislative and executive power organs of the USSR had been dissolved and replaced by transitional structures of the inter-republican coordination. Thus, trying to save itself, the Union Center, in fact, committed suicide. Mikhail Gorbachev, still formerly a president of the USSR, but without any real power now, tried after the coup to continue liberation of the new Union Treaty, promising republics even bigger share of power and authorities. But at that state, stage, Republican leaders were ready to accept only a loose association of republics on the USSR territory. They saw in the bodies of the Union Center no more than a useless bureaucratic edifice and wanted to get rid of it completely. As Boris Yeltsin put it in October 1991, now our aim is to accelerate dismantling of remnants of unitarian imperial structures and to build <clears throat> cheap and mobile inter-Republican structures. The transition period ended on the 8th of December 1991, when heads of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, Yeltsin, Kravchuk, and Shushkevich met in Belovezhskaya Pushche near Minsk and decided to formally dissolve the Soviet Union, which the same republics founded in 1922, 69 years ago. In fact, by the time of Belovezhsky meeting, uh, the USSR existed only on paper because almost all republics declared their full state independence. It was agreed in Belovezhsky Pusha to replace Soviet Union by the international association called the Commonwealth of Independent States, which by the end of December, of the same 1991 had been joined by 11 former Soviet republics except Free Baltic States and Georgia. On 25th of December 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev made a resignation statement and the red flag of the USSR over Kremlin was replaced by the tricolored flag of the Russian Federation. The history of Soviet Union came to an end. Thus, the story of disintegration of the USSR is basically a story of breakdown of an empire as a result of periphery struggle for emancipation from the dominance of metropole. The process that began in 1917 found its continuation in 1991. The keeping of imperial structure could not be combined with democratic changes and therefore was doomed. But the dissolution of the Soviet Union did not mean a radical break between the former USSR republics. By creating the Commonwealth of Independent States, they declared the intentions to develop integration from below on the post-Soviet space. The later developments showed that this integration was not an easy task, especially given the social, economic, transformational crisis on the post-Soviet territory and political tensions between the new independent states. By now, results of this integration attempts are quite limited and ambiguous. But what can be said with certain certainty is that any multinational association can be solid and sustainable only if it's based not on imperial principle with division between metropole and periphery, but on principles of voluntary participation, equal rights, and democracy. In other words, only such integration is worth that constitutes a result of free self-determination of nations. And one of the proofs of this is the fate of Soviet Union. Kitas. Thank you so much, Professor Guse, for your analytical approach to a very important stage in, in, in European politics and history. Uh, now we have dealt with the Cold War era and we are ready to move towards uh, our contemporary uh, global order and we are ready to analyze two major powers and their ambitions and aspirations, namely China and the US. But uh, before we 
moving to that stage, I would like to ask if there are any immediate reactions or comments to, uh, to our two speakers this far, very briefly, just to have a little bit of, of, of dialogue, uh, if, if there would be questions to Professors Clerk or, or Gusev. Opposition comments, questions. Please. Can you take a microphone? Yeah. Microphone is coming, so we will all, all hear you. Thank you. Uh, uh, speaking about the Soviet Union, but it's, uh, it was the Stalin's national policy, the white and rule. So this is the point of the collapse of the Soviet Union, so as far as I understand, or as far as I've been teached in the high school. Uh, and, but it's only the comment, and just uh, uh, also, so it's, uh, it's quite, uh, up to me, it's quite symbolic one. So the 20, 25th of December 1991, so uh, Mikhail Gorbachev announced that it's enough for him with the Soviet, or just Russian, or Soviet presidency. And in 31st of December 1999, Boris Yeltsin announced it's quite enough for him also. So it's quite interesting. Okay. We take a further question, one more, please. Yeah, you, will, you will get the microphone as well. Yes, sir, Claire, you talked about various issues like environment and so on. A question to Professor Clerk. You had uh, in your final analysis what is concerning all the different powers in the world. You talked about environment and so on. But to my surprise, you did not mention the internet or the global financial markets at all. And, and in my view, they are major drivers of, 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 of global integration and, and play maybe a bigger role than the other ones you mentioned. I think they are really crucial and the others are follow-ups like the, the use of fossil energy is really a follow-up of, 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 of the pricing mechanisms of energy and so on. So I think you turn it all upside down in my view. Yeah, go ahead. very quick answer that you're completely right. I think I'm, I mentioned technology and the, the use of uh, there often also our relation to science and our vision of what science should do, could do, and how we, how we are uh, relating to it. But yeah, the the, uh, the, the 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 financial, the organization of the international economy should worry us also, or should be should be something that we wonder about. What I was trying to find were historical trends that we could bring up to the present day. And most probably that's what you mentioned is, is definitely one of them. When, and when you say that I put things upside down, uh, I, I understand your point. I might have to, to sh shoe on it a bit, but, uh, but yeah, my, thank you for that. Thank you, Louis. Professor Gusev, do, would you like to respond to, to the comment? Or are you? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, let's, uh, let's move, move on. Uh, among us uh, scholars of international relations, there is an argument that the interdependence of the two contemporary major powers, uh, China and, and the US, will be very decisive when it comes to, to defining the future international order. So how that interdependence will, will develop uh, defines a lot of what emer emerges out of this transition, which Louis Clerc mentioned that we are uh, in the middle of. Uh, so we will now uh, hear a bit more about how China perceives its own role as a, as a global power, what kinds of ambitions does China have in this respect. And our next speaker will be Professor Song Wei, uh, a professor of international relations from the Renmin University in Beijing. Professor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and I want to say many thanks to uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Notable for the kind invitation. Uh, 
it's my great pleasure and honor to be here uh, to understand uh, Finland and uh, the Europe. Today, my task is to discuss Chinese global role. Uh, I do not represent the Chinese government. All I say is my personal opinion. Uh, I, speak Chinese, uh, I speak English very slowly, but I will control um, my speech in 30 minutes. Uh, I will, my uh, presentation includes three parts. The first is a brief analytical framework for Chinese foreign policy. And the second part is about historical evolution of Chinese global rule since 1949. And the final part is about the ongoing debate on Chinese foreign policy today. Uh, first of all, we should, I, I want to say, not only great powers can make playing global role as their foreign policy goals. In international relations today, middle and small states such as Sweden and Finland can have their prominent roles in global in, uh, environment, environment protection and green economy development. Actually, I think both these two countries have done very well uh, in promoting global environmental protections. But we also want to say uh, global politics has been mainly played by uh, great powers. Uh -huh. And global role, in my view, can be described as revolutionary versus constructive from the perspective of its orientations. Being revolutionary means uh, some states want to change the existing international order uh, uh, fundamentally. It's so the existing order needs to be changed to a great extent. Const being constructive means we want to improve the existing order, but basically it works, it's okay. And I also, I also want to describe global rule uh, as modest versus ambitious from the perspective of its extent. Being modest means states will concentrate on domestic development and regional influence. But being ambitious means states want to be a global player to pursue global influence in its foreign policy. Like most other great powers, Chinese foreign policy has been shaped by three factors, power status, international institutions, and political culture or political identity. And like some other great powers, Chinese foreign policy has been greatly influenced by the leadership. So what's power status? Power status means the relative power position of a great power in the international system. The power position will constrain a state's foreign policy ambition, and thus it influences the extent of Chinese global rule to be modest or to be ambitious. This factor is changeable. It depends on the development of Chinese economic and military power. The international institutions or international order can also have direct impact on states' institutional status in the international system. Are the rules favorable or unfavorable? Uh, the leadership distribution is favorable or unfavorable. That is re related to the orientation of Chinese global rule to be more revolutionary or more constructive. This factor is also changeable. And I will elaborate this point uh, 
after I discuss the leadership style, leadership perception. Political culture is shaped by two cultures, historical experience and current ideologies. Uh, ideology, the, the latter is more important. Political culture can influence the orientation of a state's global role to be revolutionary or to be uh, constructive. Chinese political culture is generally, uh, this is my personal uh, point, inclined to be revolutionary because both historical experience and current ideology supports, support such an orientation. So from the perspective of historical experience, Chinese people will memorize the glory of the Central Kingdom era. And we also uh, have strong emotions for the century humiliation by Western powers. And thus China has been craving for international recognition and international leadership. From the perspective of current ideology, China is still a socialist country with CPC, Chinese Communist Party, as the ruling party. So liberal democracy as a political ideology is unfavorable to the ruling party. However, the importance of these three constraining factors power status, international institutions, and political culture are decided by Chinese internal politics, especially the Chinese leadership. Uh, and leadership style can be described as idealistic, idealistic or realistic or balanced. If the leadership is more idealistic, then Chinese global rule will tend to be more revolutionary and ambitious. If the leadership is more realistic, then Chinese global rule will tend to be more constructive and modest. So this is a, a, a table for, the, for my uh, framework. We have three constraining factors. And the importance of these factors are shaped by the leadership style. And then we can go to the uh, assumptions of, of Chinese global rules, historical evolution. So from 1969 uh, to 1978, Chinese global rule is revolutionary and ambitious. The second stage is modest and constructive. And uh, since 20. 13, Chinese global role is becoming more ambitious and constructive. So the first stage, uh, this period is mainly characterized by Chairman Mao's leadership and his idealistic style. During this period, Chinese relative power is still uh, weak. It's we, so we considered, we considered China at, in this period is a secondary great power. And this means China should focus on domestic development and pursue limited global role. Institutional status, in, during this period, China's leadership thinks, thought we, are, we were disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. China was a member of the socialist camp and China might be a revolutionary rule in the international system. So these are two pictures. The left is, says, long live Chairman Mao, and the right picture says, the world proletarians unite to defeat American imperialism. Political culture during this period is revolutionary with strong anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism emotions. So, in, in this period, Chinese global rule uh, is very, uh, was very revolutionary and uh, ambitious. We supported the international socialist movement. Uh, we t took part in the Korean War, Vietnam, Vietnam's independence wars. We tried to pursue leadership of the inter international socialist movement. So we gave huge assistance to Albania and other socialist countries. 
Uh, today, we are, is, is still a very controversial topic in China uh, because uh, Chairman Mao's foreign policy uh, caused great difficulties for the state budget and the national economic development. And in the early 1960s, uh, in the southwest provinces of China, many people were starving to death, but we still gave uh, huge food assistance to, Vietnam, to Vietnamese. Uh, so today, people still have uh, debates on the Chinese global rules in this period, and most viewpoints are, have, uh, we have negative judgment. So the left picture is about the, the Korean War. The Chinese volunteers mm -hmm, uh, took part in the wars. The right picture is uh, about an Albanian uh, uh, girl uh, was driving a, 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 a tractor from China, huh? assisted by the Chinese government. The second stage from 1979 to 2012, uh, this, during this period, the Chinese global role was modest and constructive. Uh, this period has been characterized by the re realistic leadership style with Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao as the leadership core. During this period, China was still relatively weak, but becoming stronger. In, uh, in 2010, China became the second largest economy of the world. But the leadership has been emphasizing Chinese power weakness and trying to concentrate on the domestic problems. Thus, Chinese global role should be limited and modest. Uh, so these two pictures are showing uh, the three leaders, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and uh, Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao was chosen by Deng Xiaoping to be the successor of President Jiang Zemin. Uh, Jiang Zemin likes Western cultures. Uh, so he established a very, very good relationship with the United States. Hu Jintao is a, is a very moderate person, a little bit more conservative, but generally, these three leaders have very modest and constructive viewpoints on Chinese foreign policy. During this period, institutional status of China uh, has changed greatly. It became basically favorable in 2001, China entered into WTO, and China has, be, has been a primary beneficiary of the liberal trade system. China is also the permanent member of the UN Security Council. So China's global role should be constructive from the perspective of international institutions. Then political culture, generally revolutionary, but influenced by the opening and reform practices. So it's, it's also changing. So in, during this period, China's global role, uh, had, uh, it has very limited global objectives. For instance, we support the United, uh, United Nations and other multilateral international institutions, especially the free trade system and the G20. Uh, we still give foreign assistance to other countries, but uh, it is, is in terms of reciprocity principle and based on China's own capabilities. We also play active regional roles, such as efforts for six-party talk and uh, the establishment of China ASEAN free trade area in 2001. So these three pictures are showing Chinese participation in global affairs, six-party talk, uh, China ASEAN free trade area. Uh, the third stage from 2013 to present is Chinese foreign policy uh, is becoming more ambitious and uh, constructive, still, still constructive. President Xi Jinping is a very powerful leader and his leadership style, uh, in, my, uh, 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 in my view, uh, it tends to be more balanced, uh, more balanced. Not so idealistic, but not also um, more ambitious. Mm -hmm. 
This means China should do more contribution to the international society, but the Chinese global rule should still be constructive. Uh, let, let, me, uh, let us look at the power status. President Xi has a more optimistic view on Chinese power status as the second largest economy, and thus China should do more compared to the low profile before. Uh, so after President Xi came to power, he brought forward a lot of new plans, especially one, road, one built, one road mm -hmm, construction plan. Institutional status rules are still favorable, but China wants to improve the global governance and make it more favorable to developing countries, and China might receive higher international influence and leadership from this process. Political culture still generally revolutionary, but also still influenced by the opening and reform practices of these uh, four decades. So during this period, uh, there are only, I think since President Xi Jinping came to power, only five years passed, but uh, obvious changes have happened. Chinese global rule uh, became more ambitious uh, than before. We have stronger position on territorial issues. We brought forward the one built, one road plan, and uh, we tried to construct new type of international relations. China supports the multilateral international institutions and to construct a community of shared future. Uh, so the change of Chinese foreign policy has caused uh, some regional issues between China and uh, the neighboring countries. Uh, the left uh, picture is, is de describing China, Chinese ship is, uh, is building an island or reef mm -hmm, in South China Sea. And the right picture says Chinese uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, civil uh, uh, Chinese police ship uh, to cruise the fishing island. Mm -hmm. The third, uh, third part is about the ongoing debates on Chinese foreign policy today. Uh, the changes of Chinese foreign policy not only caused uh, controversies between China and other countries, it also has caused debates inside of China. Uh, I will mention three aspects of the debate. The first aspect is, should, should we be more ambitious or more prudent? Most of Chinese people still think the international system is composed of one superpower, many powers. Some scholars worry that ambitious global rule might make the hegemon the United States feel nervous and also lead to the overstretch of a still developing China. So yes, we are the second largest economy, but actually inside we have many, many problems. The huge wealth gap, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, we have very emergent task to, I think, to, to, to transform our economic structure. So we should still concentrate on the domestic development. We shouldn't put too, much, too many resources on global, uh, on global road. Mm -hmm. The second aspect is about, uh, shall, should China be more revolutionary or keep being uh, constructive? Some scholars are emphasizing China should provide Chinese proposals and Chinese wisdoms to the international society, and we are a model for other developing countries. So we should be another leader uh -huh, in the international system. But other scholars argue that the existing international order is favorable to China, and we don't need to struggle for the leadership uh, in haste, because it means both the, the leadership both me, uh, means both rights and responsibilities. 
China can increase its international influence step by step. At, this, at, at present, if the rules are favorable, why don't, why don't we just be a, uh, uh, to, to concentrate on domestic development? We, we just to, uh, to stay to be a beneficiary of those rules. Leadership is unnecessary. Uh, we needn't change the international system substantially. The final aspect is about alliance or non-alliance strategy. Some scholars think China should ally with Russia to counteract the pressure from the United States. Uh, some realists and some, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, those leftists are more supportive to such a viewpoint. Some other scholars think China should ally or at least establish a strategic partnership with the United States. And we shouldn't ally with Russia because of, they have many, many reasons. I have no time to, to elaborate that. But mo most scholars think China should keep its non-alliance strategy and re uh, remain relatively neutral in the international system. Forecast. Uh, Chinese global rule will remain basically stable uh, in the following five years. That is relatively ambitious and generally constructive. The future development of Chinese global rule depends on the Chinese economic development and the future leadership style is still changeable. We, I don't have a very, very determined answer to that, but in the following five years, mm -hmm, we can have a basic judgment. It will remain ambitious and constructive, but how about Chinese global role after 2020 is still in question. After 40 years opening and reform, it's not very likely that China will go back to the revolutionary global rules. Uh, so today's China is, very, is, very, is a very plural and diversified society. Uh, we have different viewpoints, and uh, the top leadership is very clear. Uh, they understand, understand this world structure very clearly that we should remain uh, modest when we, we are facing increasing pressure from the United States because we are to, now China is the second largest economy. It's very natural the United States will worry about the future development, but for the top leadership, I think they are basically rational. And for the people, after 40 years opening and reform, uh, the political culture is also changing. Uh, so it's, it's not very likely that China will go back to, 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 the, uh, to, to the revolutionary uh, 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 euro. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Songwei, for providing us uh, such a clear uh, analysis of, of the Chinese role. I think we will, we will get back to, to your presentation in the form of questions. But you made also many references to the role of the US, and it's my great pleasure now to, to invite uh, my colleague, uh, visiting senior fellow Leo Michel uh, from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs to take the floor. He will address this question, uh, the role of the US in today's world politics. Leo Michel uh, has uh, had a long career in the US uh, Defense Administration, first in Pentagon and then in the National Defense University. Uh, and we have, had, we have been luck, uh, lucky to, to have uh, Leo Michel visiting the Finnish Institute twice for, uh, for several months, first last year and now, now this year. Uh, and he's a, he's a key expert on, on US uh, security and, and defense policy. 
but here in this presentation he will take a, a bit broader perspective to, to the role of the US today. Leo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Taya. I've been fortunate um, over the past six and a half months to, to have lived in Finland as uh, you've been celebrating your 100th anniversary of independence. And it's been an opportunity to learn a lot more about Finland's culture and its history, including some of the difficult, painful parts of its history that uh, we were reminded of today. But there's another important anniversary that's taking place this year for both Americans and Europeans. And although I'm going to spend most of my time talking about more current events, I wanted to, to lead this off with a bit of a reflection. Uh, because 70 years ago, it was actually in June 1947, the Secretary of State at the time, George Marshall, gave a graduation speech at Harvard University. And it was there that he made the case for an unprecedented American effort to help Europe recover from a devastating war. And Professor Clare, in his comments, painted a brief picture of how uh, uh, devastated and how dire those circumstances were at the close of World War II. Marshall told his audience at the time that political passion and prejudice should have no part in that effort. And the following year, Congress passed with overwhelming bipartisan support legislation to support what became known as the Marshall Plan. Over four years, the following four years, the United States delivered, in today's dollars, more than $100 billion of assistance to the participating European states. Finland, for certain reasons, uh, I think not entirely by its own choice, uh, did not participate in the Marshall Plan. But that plan put uh, European states on a solid path to economic, to societal, and to political recovery. Uh, moreover, the United States, and that's not often remembered today, but the United States made it a condition of its assistance that European states work together to come up with a joint plan and to implement it together. So, in effect, the United States was encouraging the very early movement towards European integration that was inspired by visionaries like Jean Monnet and, and Robert Schumann. But Marshall, uh, of course, he was also a former general. He had been the army chief of staff during World War II. He, later, he had, in fact, been Secretary of Defense. So Marshall understood that economic and political security required defense from outside threats. So he became a very strong advocate of a permanent transatlantic alliance and this was another historical first for the United States. That vision was realized when the North Atlantic Treaty was signed in 1949. That took place a few months after he left office. But since we're here in the Finnish archives, I wanted to tell you one anecdote about Marshall, which I found in the United States State Department archives. In October 1948, Marshall was visited by the Swedish foreign minister, Osten Udin, who sought Marshall's support for Sweden's idea of a neutral Scandinavian defense bloc, composed of Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, with no outside tie, meaning that those three countries would not join the North Atlantic Treaty envisioned by Marshall. Udin acknowledged that in the event of a major conflict, Sweden could not remain neutral for any extended period, and he apparently actually assumed that the U.S. would come to Sweden's defense if it were attacked. But Undane argued that any Swedish step towards the West would, among other things, immediately have a negative effect on Finland. What was Marshall's response? He asked the Swedish foreign minister to, to consider how the world might look if Presidents Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt had maintained during the two world wars the same neutralist policy advocated by Sweden. Now Marshall was both a pragmatist and a visionary. 
He is a person who understood that American strategic interests and values were best served by building a domestic consensus for international cooperation, which he did. But cooperation for what? To advance common economic and security interests, especially with like-minded democracies. That was the task he saw ahead, and those were two areas, which I just explained, where he made a lasting contribution. And yes, the United States has made some terrible mistakes in the conduct of its foreign and defense policy over the, the decades. However, I believe, by and large, the U.S. has kept faith with the underlying thrust of Marshall's international approach. So, if that's the case, you might be wondering by now, how is it that the United States elected as its 45th president someone who declared in his inaugural speech last January that, quote, we've defended other nations' borders while refusing to defend our own. Or, quote, the wealth of the, our middle class has been ripped from their homes and then redistributed across the entire world. And, famously, his last one of his other quotes, from this moment on, it's going to be America's first, unquote. Well, look, the answer is not so simple. And I'm going to come back a little bit later to what Americans like to refer to as the elephant in the room. But I'll give you my assessment. I don't believe, I do not believe, that those sorts of sentiments accurately reflect the conviction of the majority of Americans. I do not believe that they reflect the underlying consensus on America's role in the world that's driven, for the most part, our policies um, since World War II. I think they are an anomaly. I think they are a risky and potentially dangerous departure from the norm, but I also think they are not likely to produce a global or enduring U.S. retreat or retrenchment from its international responsibilities. Now, my strongest evidence for this is actually the broad continuity in U.S. policy uh, toward Europe. Despite some unhelpful rhetoric from this president, the administration, in fact, has continued to implement the Obama administration's commitments to strengthen the U.S. military posture in Europe, especially in the Baltics, Poland, and Romania, in response to Russia's military intervention in Ukraine and its assertive, and I would say sometimes quite risky, military activities in this region. And I would underscore the United States is not alone in doing this. Close to 20 of NATO's 29 allies contribute to NATO's enhanced forward presence in this region, with multinational battalions led by the UK in Estonia, by Canada in Latvia, Germany in Lithuania, and the US in Poland. Remarkably for this administration, there is actually strong bipartisan support in Congress for this enhanced US presence and for working with our allies. There's also been continuity in the close bilateral defense cooperation between the United States and Finland and the United States and Sweden, both of which are close partners of NATO. The U.S. commitment to the, what's called the Statement of Intent, and this was signed last October by the Finnish Minister of Defense and the U.S. Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, has been reaffirmed by the current U.S. Defense Secretary, who's James Mattis, and he's done the same with uh, a similar agreement reached last year with Sweden. And as we saw last week during Secretary Mattis' uh, visit to, to Finland, both sides have been very pleased with the deepened dialogue, with the increased information sharing and the joint training and exercises that have flowed from that statement of intent. And interestingly, six weeks ago, when Sweden held its largest military exercise in decades to strengthen its deterrence and to test its defenses, nearly 1,500 American uh, troops participated along with Finnish, French, and other European militaries. And I think uh, chances are very good that this close cooperation with allies and partners like Finland and Sweden will continue for two major reasons. One reason is that while there have always been uh, some tensions within the NATO alliance, and it's not surprising, it's an alliance now of 29 sovereign countries, the top military and civilian leaders in the Pentagon, uh, I should reverse that, the top civilian and military leaders in the Pentagon, recognize why it's so important 
Um, I like what um, Secretary Mattis said not long ago. Uh, quote, nations with allies thrive and those without allies decline. We must be willing to do more than listen to our allies. We must be willing to be persuaded by them. Not all of the good ideas come from the nation with the most aircraft carriers, unquote. I agree with him. Actually, when I was in the Pentagon, I wrote some similar things. But Now, Finland, of course, is not a NATO ally, but I think his uh, approach actually would apply to, to Finland as well. Now, the other reason has to do with your neighbor to the east. During the 1990s, when I was still in the Pentagon, uh, working on issues related to uh, the U.S. attempt to, to find cooperation with Russia, I can tell you that the overall assessment of the U.S. government was that Russia would, over time, look to become increasingly democratic and integrated with the West, economically, through international organizations and so forth, and that the East-West rapprochement would translate into reduced military competition and perhaps even more military cooperation. And most of our European allies and partners at the time broadly shared that assessment. However, for a number of reasons, Vladimir Putin's ascension to power began to change the direction of Russian policy. Today, we're in a tense situation. And I think that Sweden's defense minister, Peter Hochfuss, who happens to be a social democrat, was right when he stated last May the, and I'll quote him, he said, the European security order is no longer in place as we know it because of Russia's aggressive behavior. A strong US link to Europe is important for stability in NATO and Europe, and it is only together that the US, with the US, that European countries can balance the Russians. Now, this isn't some um, disillusioned American former bureaucrat who's telling you this. It's not some right-wing commentator uh, on talk radio in the United States. This is the defense minister of your neighbor, a member in good standing of the Social Democratic Party. Celeste Wallander, uh, who was here not long ago, she was a former White House advisor on Russia to President Obama, put it this way. Uh, Realism requires us to deal with the Russia that we face, not the Russia that so many, including frankly many Russians, had hoped for. So our assessment about Russia's strategic ambitions has changed since the 1990s, and we should recognize it. The Russian leadership no longer appears to accept the rules and institutions that Russia signed on to during the 1990s, rules and institutions that Russia has selectively benefited from. If you have any doubts about this, don't listen to me. Uh, if you'd like to hear how he sees the world, I encourage you to go to the Russian presidency website and listen to, or if you don't speak Russian, read the English transcript of his intervention at the annual Valdai conference that took place last month. In particular, compare his version of what happened in Ukraine to the facts as they are understood here, elsewhere in Europe, and in the United States. Now, the U.S., of course, is a global power, and outside of Europe, the picture, I will admit, is more mixed. And frankly, I would say the risks of damage to U.S. credibility and long-term strategic interests seem a little bit higher. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through the whole world, but let me focus on two examples. First of all, in Asia. North Korea's nuclear ambitions, we know, date back to the 1990s, but its recent actions really have sharply increased the risk of military conflict. In recent months, it's de uh, detonated a nuclear device. I think this is the sixth time it's done that, that. But the device, many times more powerful than the weapons that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's also tested ballistic missiles, assessed as capable of, of striking US territory, as well as Japan and of course South Korea. Even short of crossing the nuclear threshold, nuclear, uh, North Korea could inflict massive casualties on the South using chemical weapons and conventional artillery deployed near the de demilitarized zone. And the consequences of a failure of deterrence in Korea would be dramatic. Um, our defense secretary has said that the military 
uh, conflict there would be tragic on an unbelievable scale, and I believe him. Uh, the geostrategic uh, fallout, if you will, could include a very sharp deterioration in U.S. relations with China and Russia, both of which border on North Korea. It could mean even a reappraisal of U.S. defense alliances with South Korea or, and or Japan, especially if those countries viewed Washington as partly responsible for the conflict. Probably, almost certainly, I would say, would involve the transfer of important U.S. military capabilities that are now in Europe to meet more urgent war fighting and stabilization requirements in Asia. I would agree with those who say that the U.S. President's public statements uh, are causing a lot of concern, have caused a lot of concern in that area. Two months ago, he tweeted that, uh, quote, South Korea is finding, as I have told them, that the talk of appeasement with North Korea will not work. They will only, they meaning the North Koreans, will only understand one thing, exclamation point in his tweet. So during his recent visit while in Japan and South Korea, the president avoided that kind of extreme and taunting rhetoric, which he had used previously on Twitter and in his speech to the United Nations, but only to revert to name calling a few days later. To their credit, at the same time, his Secretary of Defense and his Secretary of State say, and I believe them, that they are looking hard for a diplomatic pathway to reduce tensions. But in the end, I think one has to wonder if the credibility and influence of the U.S. in the Asia-Pacific region might be eroding before our very eyes. Consider this. The spike in tensions has raised unaccustomed questions regarding the credibility of U.S. defense guarantees to its allies. Polls taken in South Korea shortly before the president's visit showed the majority of South Koreans favor acquiring nuclear weapons of their own. This is a disturbing development. Or consider this. One of the president's first acts upon taking office was to withdraw the United States from the pending Trans-Pacific Partnership, the, TTP, the TPP, which would have constructed a trading bloc that includes 40% of the world's, of the global GDP. So what have the other 11 nations done? They agreed last week to build the trade bloc without the United States. Ironically, the big winner from the US withdrawal from TT, TPP likely will be China, a country that the president sharply criticized while a candidate, although he now, to quote him, gives China credit, great credit, credit he said, for this skill in having taken advantage of previous U.S. administrations. My second example, uh, the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran. Uh, here, uh, the president clearly wants to break with his predecessor's approach. He's called for renegotiation of the agreement under which Iran uh, agreed to accept certain restrictions on its nuclear activities and submit to a very, uh, a, a vigorous verification regime in return for relief from sanctions. He says he wants to extend the scope and duration of the restrictions on Iran, uh, but also make Western compliance contingent upon changes in Iranian behavior outside the nuclear arena. So he's trying to link different things. Um, and it's true, uh, some of these Iranian actions are of concern. It's support for proxies in Syria and Lebanon and, and Yemen. But to link them, uh, I'm not so sure. And he warned that if uh, allies and his administration and, and Congress don't reach an agreement on all of this somehow, he would terminate uh, U.S. involvement in the multilateral agreement. Uh, not surprisingly, Iran has categorically rejected any renegotiation of the agreement. But the U.S. position, but the, the new U.S. position, also poses some risks here to transatlantic relations. The British and the French and the German leaders have jointly declared that they remain committed to the agreement. Uh, they are not naive about Iran, but they worked long and hard and in good faith to achieve the accord, fearing that an unfettered Iranian nuclear program would lead, in fact, to wider proliferation in the region and perhaps even a U.S. military intervention with unpredictable consequences. 
So I would say in the word of caution, the stage is set for a possible sharp deterioration of the situation in the region. And that would have serious uh, repercussions for transatlantic relations as well. So where does this leave us? And here I'll, I'll conclude my remarks with three observations. First, as far as the president is concerned, it's my personal opinion that it's hard to foresee any real change in his approach or his conduct when it comes to foreign or for that matter, even domestic affairs. He seems preoccupied with maintaining the loyalty of his base of voters. He takes a very transactional approach in domestic as well as international affairs. He seems to prize unpredictability. He does not seem very wedded to alliances or multilateral efforts in general. On the other hand, according to polls at least, roughly 58% of the American public as a whole disapprove of his job performance, while only 38% uh, approve. And it's interesting that in recent weeks, three senators of his own party, uh, three very conservative senators of his own party, have openly questioned his fitness for office. Second, uh, there are checks and balances in the U.S. political system. Now, uh, these are perhaps more evident in domestic affairs, but it's true to some extent in foreign policy as well. Just one example. You perhaps noticed last week that the president dismissed the extensive Russian meddling in last year's election as a hit job, a hit job, by Democratic politicians. And he called his critics on Russia policy, quote, haters and fools. Well, you might also want to remember that it was the Republican-controlled House of Representatives that voted 419 to 3 in favor of additional sanctions on Russia. And the Republican-controlled Senate voted 98 to 2 for the measure. And those votes took place in large part because of outrage over Russia's extensive uh, attempts to interfere with the US election. And despite vocal opposition from the president, uh, who had no choice in the end but to sign the bill into law. But it is also true that the president maintains wide authorities in the conduct of foreign policy and remains the commander in chief of the US armed forces. So I would say while we haven't had what I would call a real test of his crisis management abilities, uh, he could potentially, and perhaps in some ways already has, uh, done some long-term damage to US soft power. And that's of concern to me. That is our power to attract the type of support that we've had internationally from visionaries uh, and uh, pragmatists um, like George C. Marshall, the soft power, the power to attract support because of admiration and respect for U.S. institutions and values. A final point, while I have learned more about my own country during my stay in Finland, I've also learned more about European politics since some important elections have taken place here in 2017 and will take place in 2018 and 2019. I'm mindful of the differences, of course, between various European countries and uh, uh, between the various European systems and, and our American system. But I think in all honesty, there's some broader lessons to be learned from what's happened in my country. And I would put it this way, when the political discourse becomes so d detached from the facts and when fierce debate over policy descends into crude personal attacks, when the democratic virtues of pragmatism, tolerance, and yes, compromise become derided, and when politics in general becomes conflated with entertainment or simply ignored, like yesterday's tired reality television series, in the end, if those things take place uh, in Europe or in the United States, all democracies will lose. And we may find it harder than we think to recover those values and practices that so many have sacrificed uh, so much to protect. And I think that's true in Finland as well as my own country. And I'll leave you with a bit of an ambiguous message here. 
uh, you may have, some of you may have heard this quote before, but the renowned British wartime leader, Sir Winston Churchill, once famously quipped that you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they have exhausted all the other options. Uh, and in my view, this administration is about to test whether Sir Winston's rather backhanded compliment still applies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leo. I'm sure there are questions and comments to both of our, our uh, speakers of, of this part of the session, but we will uh, convene into a panel uh, after President Tarja Halonen's uh, presentation. It is my great pleasure now to, to invite President Tarja Halonen to take the floor, and uh, it is also uh, fair uh, for us to deal with uh, other important players of world politics than, than, than states, we do believe, and, and at least we hope from a, from a small state perspective, that multi-diplomacy and multilateral uh, institutions and organizations would play a role still in the future, and that there would be political actors uh, believing in, in, uh, in the, the multilateral order. Uh, so President Halonen's title will be the United Nations, the European Union, and the crisis of multi-diplomacy can small states influence world politics. Uh, Tarja Halonen was the president of the Republic of Finland from, from the year 2000 until 2012. Uh, and before that, she has had various functions in the Finnish government. And after that, she has had various international functions in the, uh, in the context of the UN and uh, other, other international bodies. So, President Halonen, the floor is yours. And then President Halonen, by the way, will, will join the board of the University of Helsinki in January and, and yeah. together with me. <laughs> Welcome. Just for the beginning, thank you very much uh, for invitation to be here. And uh, I think that I'm a layman among the scientists. But uh, sometimes it's uh, perhaps also useful for you uh, to know more and more those persons who are making the substance what you are studying. So in, in a way, a certain type of the guinea pig. But, um, I'm also glad to be here at the National Archives tonight because I think that there is a renewed interest towards history and also archives. Uh, although some talk about the post-fact era or alternative facts era, I would say that facts are still facts, of course, with, uh, with a different dimension, but I still hope that we can find facts. Our common sustainable future and rule of law-based systems uh, stems from the foundation that we have an authentic, true documentation. And you know from the professionals that how difficult it's sometimes to find in the history. So <clears throat> Finland and other countries have gone through a national process of democratization. It is a path where different countries are, of course, at the different stages. Um, at global level, Multilateralism is a process of, of democratizing international relations and politics. So it is a continuous path of developments, um, sometimes positive, sometimes negative trends, but um, I'm very convinced that it is ongoing and it is a necessary process. So, ladies and gentlemen, small countries like Finland, uh, you might say that they depend on the multilateral system. So I think that everyone is doing the same, but the small countries, because of their practical circumstances, they have learned it a little bit earlier. Uh, but I do hope so that others will do too. Um, and I think that even the small countries, they have an important role to play in different global fora where they can influence decisions and outcomes through perhaps sometimes smart cooperation. I'm going to talk about, as you have asked, about the developments in the European Union and also in the United Nations. 
Also, I wish to see, I wish to see how sustainable development and so-called sustainable peace are linked in the multilateral system. Although there are many challenges around, I think that the small countries can influence matters better through the United Nations and EU, better than what they could do with the direct diplomacy. And I think that it can be also smart for the bigger ones. So many global problems are complex challenges, like uh, conflicts which make people escape their own neighborhoods and countries as a matter of life and death. Uh, in these types of situations, there are no simple causal effects. Instead, uh, years, of, uh, years of work and silent daily grind is needed to influence the root causes of a conflict. Regardless of the real circumstances, simple explanations and easy, quick fixes may sound more lucrative uh, to the public, also to the very good, sophisticated media, although such fixes don't work normally in reality. To sustain peace, we would need to learn to analyze successful resolutions of conflicts. By this, I mean that we should, so to say, uh, also archive these cases in order to learn from them. Uh, past experiences will not help, of course, to solve the, all the future conflicts, but I think that they can give also the lessons which might bring us forward. Um, I have proposed in different places sometimes that uh, we could also try to document uh, such kind of the peace processes which at, at least partly have made an success. And with the success, I mean that uh, it takes a lot of time to, to get an agreement, uh, but uh, in Belfast uh, University, they noticed that most of them, they, they last uh, after, after the signatories only five years. And that, I think that this is really the loss of time and expertise to do so. And, and that's why I come back to that. That's what I hope that United Nations is now doing for the future. So, <laughs> I <coughs> I used to know European Union. I have been quite much out of that already last last years, not being uh, directly in, in, in Finland uh, official representation. So, but anyway, I still agree that European Union as such is a successful story of peace. But um, it has been also um, the ground or the home place for the other peace stories, which uh, I think that could be pretty useful. So um, I think an example, I'm not trying to flatter the Irish, but, but I think an example is the, is the resolution of the conflict in Northern Ireland. And if I have been at least uh, many, many of the Irish, but also British have said that, that uh, if not the UK and the Ireland, uh, hadn't been the members of the EU, it would have been, at, at least if we say in positive way, it would have been more difficult to, to, uh, to, to reach the, the peace agreement. And I see that she's nicking also. We have not agreed this beforehand. So, um, so what about the situation now, you might say, that uh, the pro lady is trying to defend the European Union? So, okay, with Brexit, we are facing a new situation. But what uh, do we mean by crisis in the European Union? Some say that there is an economic, political, and trust crisis in Europe. Yeah, true, in many places. At the same time, some journalists have list listed security threats, for instance, unemployment, financing, migration. Uh, but Brexit and rise of nation na na nationalists or populists as factors in the EU um, so, but it, it varies between the studies, how people see this interlink. And I think it would be uh, ideal to, to study it for the while. So certain studies show that uh, unemployment is the main reason for the citizens' lower trust in political and legal institutions and in rejecting immigrants. Many young people, of course, they are unemployed in Europe, and uh, some of them have turned to populist parties. But then other actors see conservative culture, cultural attitudes or identity crisis as a bigger reason than unemployment. 
when seeing the results of different elections recently in Germany, in Czech Republic, France, Austria, UK, the results really, they are not quite the same. Uh, probably the answer lies somewhere in between as several aspects of life are connected, but I hope really that some of you might have an interest to, to study it further. So, a major enlargement of the European Union took place, so-called Big Bang. It was in uh, 2004. Um, like, uh, uh, it has been already mentioned, they mentioned that um, I have been in the previous positions in the Finnish uh, government, and I noticed also during your lessons <laughs> that, oh no, I have been involved. Uh, for instance, I was a um, Minister of Justice in, uh, in Finland when uh, uh, it was in 1990-91, when the Soviet Union was breaking down, uh, and, and we had the pleasure to get the hijackers and all, all such kind of the not uh, invited guests to, my, to our country, like also to, to Sweden, and we tried to solve it, what to do with this, uh, these people. Um, then I was, um, from 96 to 2000, I was a foreign minister of, of this country, and so I have seen how the uh, new old friends came from the central eastern part of Europe, uh, first to, to knock at the door, uh, to the Council of Europe and then to the European Union. And so you might say that I am one of those who take a responsibility for the political fact that this short engagement period happy to, 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 to finish with the weddings and now marriage, which sometimes goes better and sometimes not so happily, like it happened between the people. So I think still that it was an historical op opportunity to do because if we wouldn't marry them, somebody, would, somebody else would do that. And I don't know whether our common life would be better. But anyway, so the enlargement of the European Union has not always been so easy process, and it was neither then. The European Union needs a shared set of values and a common framework. And w without this, it is not possible to work together effectively. Although most of the member states have been part of the European Union already now for 13 years or more, a common framework is not self-evident truth for the everyone. So um, when I remember this uh, time of the enlargement, so normally I think that at least the Finnish researchers remember very well, everybody said that normally the European Union has done in two ways. Uh, first, the enlargement, and then the deepening the integration, but not at the same time. And we tried to do it at the same time. Whether it was too ambitious or not, I don't know. But um, other way around, I think that becoming so fast, so big, it would be also very important to underline on the, the frames why to do it. And um, now I come out of my written text, I will say that I used to say to my, my colleagues over that time when I was a foreign minister, I said that we everybody knows that when uh, it's a time of the engagement between the human beings, you are promising even the moon from the sky. But then when the wedding bells have been ring, and when it starts the marriage, so you are very... Uh, uh, unhappy if the other one is reminding you even about what you have promised. And uh, perhaps the system what we have in the Council of Europe that we, we uh, passed first on the basic package and then we followed very openly that how the new member countries fulfilled their demands could be better in the European Union. Also, but European Union made it in different way. And they took them in and they thought that, like I think in Asia very often the Chinese friends have said to me that we, we teach them in the family. And we know how difficult it is to teach them in the family. But um, the other reason perhaps what we can discuss in the panel more is that uh, all what has happened in the last 70 years in Europe 
has made also the new profile for the different countries, whether they feel themselves victims, or they are the winners, or they are losers, or they are the inheritance, the former empires, whether they would like to see them also the present eagles, and, and so on. And, and that's why it's, it's um, pretty interesting to try to put this all together for the harmonious family. So, anyway, I think that we shouldn't give up. We have to continue now and to see what we have difficulties and go on. Um, and um, I think that you have in your mind even more difficulties what we have had in the European Union. Uh, we shouldn't uh, forget the outside world. It is changing all the time. They are not waiting for us that whether Europe is ready. Um, visiting Africa and Asia, especially Africa, uh, people sometimes say to me that it was a time when we wanted to follow what Europe and European Union especially will give. But nowadays we see that you have all the time something domestic going on, that you have no time for the outside world. This is partly true, but perhaps it would be also useful for the, uh, the others that they don't try to follow up what we have done, not at least in the same way repeating the same mistakes. So, for instance, the European Union's plan to resettle refugees from Italy and Greece has been not success very well, partly, but uh, we are not satisfied. Um, and even though certain member states receive more money from the European Union than they pay uh, in themselves, uh, they have not been eager to follow the resettlement deal and to do their part. They still feel that they are the victims. We have to understand them. I don't mention any names. And, and this, of course, creates uh, difficulties because at the global scale, we are not specially victims, none of us, because the life has been pretty hard, rather hard for many other nations also outside of Europe. So let's go a little bit now the EU, from EU to the United Nations. So I think that uh, whether we want or not, we have to see that uh, the role of the multilateralism is a need. Uh, it, it's, uh, we cannot avoid it, and that we can see especially in the United Nations. Without the multilateral system, it would be very difficult to fight against the climate change, build peace, or make disarmament work. It would also be hard to fight corruption and international crime uh, address migration flows or work towards human, uh, towards human rights and better labor standards. So they are the different organizations and, and, and uh, they have made um, steps forward, even they have not been perfect. So let me mention even something more concrete, uh, which is not so splendid, but very, very uh, interesting. Only through international cooperation, our everyday communication has become possible, be it traditional mail or cell phone net networks, and there are also many security requirements in global plane and sea traffic, which are part of the multilateral standard setting. Our everyday life would not work without these multilateral, multilateral standards. So this is not to say that the United Nations could go on without and reform, without reform. The UN faces many challenges, and some of the member states prefer, prefer to work bilaterally instead of the multilateral deals. Um, together with other partners, the European Union is trying to push the reform agenda forward. So anyway, I will be again very optimistic. A major part of the uh, of the member countries of the U UN understand very easily the need to work together. And that's good. So um, also in the countries where the leaders of the, leaders of the country have been against the system, uh, it seems to be that at the different levels of the nation, they are strong support, both for the Paris Agreement, uh, 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 climate change, or in many other issues. And this is one of the points what I try to say, that uh, you know all these uh, examples, of course. Uh, this summer, for instance, President Trump of USA brought to forward his, in his intention to withdraw the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement. 
Um, this was only a few months after the agreement had entered into force. The response of the world was strong. Other governments underlined even more their commitment to the agreement, and also many American states, cities, and companies highlighted their support for it, and um, have ever since continued their actions. This is a very simple example how the single actor's behavior or misbehavior can strengthen others' multilateral bonds. And I would say only that <clears throat> uh, I would really want to listen how our, our very respected uh, guest uh, from USA could also explain a little bit an American's politics more than the European or Russian politics, but, but interesting as such, of course, too, uh, because uh, we, with many of my, my colleagues in different international organizations, we have tried to find what's the logic of this and, and how to come out. And my still very optimistic opinion is that I almost see already President Trump knocking at the back door saying that, yes, I'm not so much against the agreement, but it could be better for USA. Okay, that's my optimistic view, but, but let's see. So, but the audience, uh, this is not only the US, USA. It's in different countries the same. You mentioned already in one of the questions about internet, and you could also to continue, we can continue in the inter panel that uh, the modern societies with different layers and they are crossing in different ways. So they are not, an, they are not a pyramid of the power in old way, but it's, it's in different ways uh, going these parts. And how to handle this kind of the system is, is, is very, very interesting. Finland is uh, supporting an Austrian research institute, ISSA, uh, where they, uh, they are specialized in system analysis. And I have always wanted to see that, for instance, when uh, sustainable development, where I have been involved since Rio's meetings, so um, how you can push a different kind of the actors in the society, like, uh, of course, uh, the heads of the states and governments, but also the business leaders, NGOs, academia, to go to the same line without having a right to command them how to do it. I call it an ecoplasm. I hope that some, somehow we could find the ways how it would be a little bit faster because um, the nature cannot wait for us. So small states are normally strong supporters of United Nations as they feel that the rule-based multilateral works in their favor, so they try to use the opportunity. An incentive can also be an open global economy or the trade system, and it can be argued that the UN gives the small countries a possibility to play a bigger role than they size is because it's the voting system, but I would say, for instance, the Security Council gives for the founding fathers and mothers a, a, a strong position. In addition to the principle of one vote per country in the UN General Assembly, there are other opportunities too for small countries. Many times representatives from the smaller countries can have a special role in multilateral negotiations, for example, as a facilitators. They are not so dangerous. You can listen to them without taking any risk that they are doing by themselves. And um, so uh, in that way, um, in a special and well-selected field, a small country can sometimes not all, can become an important expert at the United Nations. Of course, not all small states are similar, and there are different possibilities and capabilities to take such tasks, but in any case, small states can be sometimes more flexible, or at least I would say less dangerous than their big sisters, also as they need to use their resources, I would say, more cautiously or wisely. So for the small countries themselves, a constructive way of cooperation is very important. Although there are tendencies towards to use the hard power in today's world, those concepts that have been named smart power or soft power have not disappeared. There are all kinds of the systems in, in our international system, but I think that our common goal challenges have forced us to work together even more than before. 
uh, with the SDGs, with the sustainable development goals, we have learned that not even the biggest countries can change it well. And that's why we need each other. So the audience, so how is the role of the EU, EU in the United Nations? Hmm. So, uh, European Union, Union would like to see it as a bigger player in the United Nations. Um, and sometimes it still plays an important role. Uh, it is one of the most developed regional actors um, in the international setting, which I don't mean to underestimate the other regional actors in Africa or in Asia. But um, European Union, for instance, it is, and its member states, they are the single largest financial contributor to the UN system. And also they have been the world's most notable aid donor. The EU and its members remain active at the UN as the EU is committed to effect multilateralism. One thing what I have never understood concerning the USA is that US, I have during my time to be in international politics, they have been leaving the ILO and then they come back. Now they have left in UNESCO and one day we will see them to come back. But all the time when they have had this, how could I say, disagreements, after all they have paid quite much for the UN. So why to pay if you are not in? I would stay and even be difficult, but to stay inside and not go out and in and, and out and in. But I think that <laughs> you are not <laughs> the good to answer for this question. But, but anyway, so I mean that let's hope that in the future everybody is staying in, even if they are difficulties. I think that in the European Union we have in spite of the UK, no more, mainly these kind of the people, countries who can be quite difficult, but they are always inside still. But uh, as a group, European Union can have a stronger negotiation grounds, could be at the UN. This is also one of the situations when I think that, that then all European countries, which are globally more or less small, they could be better heard. But um, let's be very realistic. The European Union does not have a joint position on every issue on the UN agenda. And that's why uh, sometimes they cannot say that we Europeans or we EU member countries want this or that, because they have not done joint, joint opinion. And in this way, I have always compared, it's very interesting when we think about the history of USA, where the Member states are very different in some, for instance, in criminal law or in many other cases, but they have one common currency and they have the common foreign, foreign policy, which after the negotiations will be always the same everywhere. When the European Union, vice versa, when you join to the European Union, you have to accept a certain criminal and civil codes. For instance, um, and the, death penalty is not allowed, um, at least not in practice. So you cannot become a member if you have it. Uh, so another way around, uh, as you know, so euro is not the currency in all EU countries. And you know also that we have had uh, somewhat difficulties or challenges to fight the common foreign and security politics. So it's very interesting to compare these two different areas and how they have come to together and then have a different profiles. The future will tell that what will happen. But um, uh, what I think that has been interesting is, is of course, that, uh, that uh, in some issues, really, like I mentioned, the European Union countries have become much closer now to each other. Um, and this is very far from the normal foreign and security politics, but I will tell it. For instance, uh, I have noticed when I have worked for the UN, UN also in, uh, in the area of the human rights, that uh, even in the countries which can easily normally uh, accept the human rights principles, they have in practice uh, difficulties in sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, questions. Uh, it is really, really difficult issue. But now, for instance, EU countries use, they 
very uh, also technically in these issues. But this autumn, European Union and UN launched a joint initiative to eliminate violence against women. And the size of the project is 500 million euros, and it is based on multi-stakeholder trust fund. And this is a new initiative. It's a bit too early to examine concrete results, but anyway, in this case, I, I hope that it is one important step forward, and especially when we notice that also the citizens of the EU and also USA, they in more globally, they have answered, I think it was surprising for me, so, so strongly for this Me Too campaign. So I mean that in a way they echoed already the need of the citizens. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is a long tradition of cooperation between the European Union and UN anyway. Since 2003, for instance, they have worked together to strengthen their strategic partnership in the peacekeeping and crisis management. Uh, so many of today's crises are not wars between the nation states, but non-state actors are involved. How do the UN and the EU react to these situations and how can they help to maintain real peace? One way is to cooperate. The European Union has different types of the tools to prevent and solve crises in close cooperation with the UN and other partners. Also, there are mediation initiatives supporting the traditional role of religious leaders in preventing conflicts. Uh, women's voices may be better heard in conflict prevention and peacemaking these days, but a lot remains to be done. The uh, European Union has been active in crisis management and response. It has tried to solve conflicts and support peaceful development in post-conflict societies. After 2003, the European Union has had almost 30 operations, and most of them have been civil and crisis management operations. The biggest operation has been the EUX in, in Kosovo. Uh, Finland has been an engaged partner to and committed part, partner to adv advance civil and crisis management. And in the matter of fact, originally it was Sweden and Finland, which uh, the countries which proposed it to the European Union, and we could get them also the civil and crisis management in this. And um, although every operation faces its own challenges, it would be harder to achieve results without multilateral cooperation. And also small countries like Finland would have difficulties to give their contribution or influence the policies without such kind of the cooperation. So uh, once again, excuse that I have taken European Union as an example, African and Asian regional cooperators have done also a lot. Now, uh, the last, but last point, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres wished to strengthen the tie of linkage between the sustainable development and sustainable peace. And conflict prevention and sustainable development are, like I say in pragmatic way when I'm, the, I'm not a scientist, I said it's like the two legs of the genes. Both are needed for lasting outcome. Uh, somebody would like only with one leg, but no, most of us would like to get the both. And, and so um, I do hope so that, um, that uh, we could now to see the possibilities um, how, to, how to work with that. And um, I already mentioned that the peace accords last uh, normally about five years average, and people who have experienced conflict should be able to see that the civil life goes forward and there is a development. Of course, it's very good that if the arms are silent, but you should get also the peace. And that's one of the ideas we try now to do. I'm interested to see how we can work effectively together in the UN Secretary General's high-level advisory board on mediation. The members of the board give advice to the Secretary General and assesses ongoing conflicts and peace process. And although this panel consists of individuals and not the representatives officially of the member states, the work is based on multilateralism and I'm looking forward to our first meeting next week. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, 
I would like to encourage all the organizers of this conference to continue the important work you are doing. Uh, your analysis, documentation, insight, and history knowledge is really needed in today's multidimensional world. And uh, so, if I should put it very short, when you have uh, um, eagles of the past and today, I will say that I don't know about the eagles, but everybody should learn to fly together. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Halonen. I would now ask you to take a seat, and I would also like to invite all the other speakers of this last session to, to come here uh, and, and to convene into a panel. And, and I now give, I, on my behalf, I thank, thank the speakers and, and give the floor now back to Director Jussi Nuorteva, who will chair the panel. life cycle ended for that microphone. But we will go further and thank you very much for the presentations. They were very interesting, they were very straightforward, they were very open and very analytical. And I must say that I admired all these talks that were given, they were really opening the floor both to the superpower politics and also to the important role of the multilateral organizations. I was sitting last week in the general conference of the UNESCO, and uh, luckily also the United States still participates in the practical work and is sitting and taking participate in the discussions. I had also two weeks before experience about what also small nations can do in the multilateral organizations we were handling in the International Advisory Committee of the UNESCO's Director General, the question about the comfort of women that has been a burning issue between the Japan, China, Korea. And we were able to formulate a proposal that we hope that will satisfy all these parties. It won't be a final decision, but it gives us more time to look at the things together. But I would like to ask first Professor Song Wei, because you were talking about the Chinese role and also that China is advancing very steady steps and looking at the situation. But uh, listening also to your president talking at the previous, uh, the very, uh, the, the party congress that we had just a short time ago. I think that the message was that China is going to take much more active role in the great power politics of the world. How do you see the situation? How, do, how would you interpret the, the, the talk that he gave? Uh, personally, uh, I'm a realist, so I stick to the principle of prudence. So, uh, during the past five years, uh, President, the President Xi has brought forward a very, very grand plan to const construct a, uh, a community, a human community of shared futures. Uh, and the leadership has held many uh, meetings on how to improve global governance. So we want to establish uh, the AIRB Asian 
uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, we want to promote the One Belt, One Road plan. We want to do many, many things on the global level. But personally, uh, uh, I'm more prudent. I think, yes, we are living in a, a global village. Mm -hmm. China has many, many common interests with other countries. But the most emergent task for China now is to solve the domestic problems. Mm. The leadership, global leadership is important, but it's not so urgent for China. Uh, obviously, the president has an uh, optimistic and a different uh, opinion from mine. So, I remember he has, missed, he has said, now we are the second largest economy, so we need to do some things on the global level. But yes, it's a gr great plan to improve uh, global governance. It's, a, it's great to provide international public goods. Maybe China can get more international influence through this process, but is also very risky because those countries uh, along the uh, one built one road, uh, the line, uh, usually they are, uh, they are countries with high risks. So if we put too many resources into the international plan, the global plan, that will, I think, on the long run, um, Maybe it will uh, add new obstacles for Chinese, the development of Chinese national power, and to it will add some obstacles for our domestic reform plans. But uh, yeah, but in China, <laughs> yeah, the leadership is so ambitious. Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's very good for its global governance. We, try, we, we want to do some to, to provide international public goods. Um, but many scholars, including myself, we are not so optimistic. Just my, just my personal opinions. Would President Halonen want to comment this? Because this is very interesting, the role of, and very positive role of China in the multilateral work. So I do hope so that uh, you see also the possibility that you can combine these two aspects in, for instance, in sustainable development, what China has done uh, concerning the eco cities and, and uh, the issues of energy and so on, because you are also by far the, if not, yeah, the, you will be the biggest, uh, biggest uh, area of the markets for this sense. So if you take an initiative and do the things further, so your, the echo of the word, and also by the business community, will be very great and strong. Um, I, can, I can say an example from small Europe, that when Germany took an opinion concerning the nuclear power, the negative um, opinion on that, so, so uh, we and, uh, said that they will uh, invest in uh, renewable energy. So, so it's, uh, it, it gave a really big impulse for, for the sector. And of course we know that if the Germany will, uh, in the halfway uh, response to, to decrease the use of the coal, and for instance to be uh, using instead of that uh, gas, not oil but gas, so it will have also the very, it will be the very important issue in, in the European energy politics. And I think that the China's responsibility for its own people, but also an example for the others could be very, very useful in that sense. Of course, it differs from different areas, and I hope that uh, the international conflicts don't break your good, good way to work in, in uh, SDGs. Thank you. We had also some questions about the role of the United States, and I would now like to give floor first to Leo. Michael, and then to other speakers, and then I will open the door also for the interventions from the audience. Um, 
Thanks. On, on China, and I will um, go back to my own background, which is mainly in defense and security affairs, um, I've observed that there is actually been a great deal of continuity in previous administrations, both through uh, Republican and Democratic administrations. If you go back to that of uh, George H.W. Bush, Bush 41 as he's called, uh, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, they've all had, using uh, different rhetoric, they've all had uh, this notion of uh, rebalance, paying more attention to what's going on in Asia Pacific, and broadly speaking, with regard to China, a strategy of seeking cooperation, and at the ha same time hedging, which is uh, making sure that in terms of the security and defense side, that American capabilities and that alliances in Asia remain strong. It's a very balanced, but certainly not um, uh, to provoke a, a conflict with China, to seek cooperation, which we've done in the past, for example, on North Korea. Um, uh, the current president is, um, as I said during his campaign, he had uh, extreme, I would say, anti-Chinese rhetoric, accused China of uh, raping the United States economy, this type of language, which is uh, very unhelpful. He's, he certainly has changed his tune a lot, but at the same time, I think has done it in a way, as I said, to call into question uh, U.S. credibility and the confidence that people can have in the agreements we make. And it simply doesn't make sense to me uh, to withdraw from the TPP, which is beyond its economic and trade effect, it's really a strategic reaffirmation of U.S. It would have been a strategic reaffirmation of U.S. concern and interest and uh, outreach to the Asia-Pacific nations, to, to 11 of those countries. Uh, and he simply withdraws from it saying, oh no, he's going to have better bilateral deals. And as I said in my remarks, the result is that we're going to have an important trade block. It won't be as important, but an important trade block with 11 countries, but the U.S. won't be at the table. And that's a shame. Uh, on the security side, it's uh, good to hear the professor's opinion that uh, China is very uh, interested in multilateral cooperation and, and so forth. Uh, its extension of uh, its claim to territorial sovereignty over virtually the entire region of the South China Sea, uh, which has not been accepted by an international tribunal, which is very contested by three or four other countries uh, uh, in the region, uh, and which is tested, frankly, by the United States when we send uh, naval ships. By the way, we're not the only one. If you happen to read Le Monde from time to time, you'll see a very interesting account on how a French warship in the past couple weeks uh, has also uh, navigated through that region, really for the same reason, to demonstrate that these are international waters and that one should not accept a unilateral claim such vast sovereignty, and that could be an area of uh, possible friction in the future. Now I would like to continue to Professor Gusev. We had also questions relating to Russia, so please, you have the mic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think uh, the subject of our discussion now, as it mentioned in the program, uh, do uh, modern uh, empires rule the world now? And I think that uh, the empire itself uh, is a pre-modern conception. So uh, the objective development of the world makes empires outdated. And in the world of globalization, there is no place for empire. There will no be restoration of any kind of empire. And to the conception of empire linked the conception of so-called multipolar world. You see, uh, there are uh, two views of the uh, contemporary world system. One uh, conception is multipolar and the other conception is polycentric. 
And I would prefer polycentric definition because multipolar conception, which is used in uh, many official foreign policy documents, both in Russia and in China and maybe in some other uh, countries, but it's not very adequate because multipolarism uh, presupposes conflict, presupposes rivalry, and this is not very productive in international relations. I can quote um, the formulation from the uh, Russian-American uh, um, declaration made in 2002. And uh, it says that we reject the model of international relations based on the uh, rivalry of uh, great powers. We are for cooperation. Unfortunately, this uh, the declaration was not realized in practice, as, in practice, as we know. But I think that from theoretical point of view, it's the very good and adequate uh, <clears throat> reflection of the model we should aspire for. Uh, international community, yes, not a, a combination of uh, warring and rivaling uh, great powers. And, uh, what should be done by international, uh, the main actors of international relations now is to try to realize this. Unfortunately, the um, current leadership of the United States, uh, and I, I personally can say the, in the current leadership of Russia, are not very interested in that, in uh, that realization of this model. But I think the future belongs to it. And finally, Louis Claire. Um, yeah, actually, actually, I have. I'm, I'm going to use the opportunity to ask questions to my colleagues because I, I, uh, I thought there were two things I wanted to, to um, maybe ask them. Uh, first, Leo, Michel, there's a. You you say that uh, the U.S. is basically tripping over its own soft power. There's a, there's a problem with with uh, long term long term damage being made to to the uh, the soft power of the country. Do you think there is also long-term damage made to the, uh, to the diplomatic standing and to the diplomatic apparatus, the diplomatic corps, the State Department as an institution by the Trump presidency, but also by the, uh, the, uh, the mandate in, in, in the State Department of, of Tex Tillerson? Uh, then to Professor Gusev, you were talking about uh, the end of the... Uh, the end of the Soviet Union and and uh, this this time I would like to jump to uh, to to the present day and ask you in in Russia I was I was almost going to say Russia today but in the in the uh, Russia in the present day what's the role of of um, historical memory when they look at this at the end of the of the uh, of, of the Cold War and the, non, the 1990s how is it uh, used maybe by the current administration in the current around the president, around President Putin, as maybe an, an argument in their foreign policy. We've been tricked in the 1990s to accept certain things, and now we're going to set to set wrongs right. Uh, then the, the memory of of the the revolution in 1917 as something profoundly destabilizing, etc. How how are historical events uh, used by the current the current presidency? This would be my two questions. <laughs> In terms, of, in terms of the State Department, the Trump administration, uh, I think it was in February or March, put forward a budget, a proposed budget for the next fiscal year. And in that, they proposed approximately a 30% cut in the Department of State budget, which would have basically eliminated um, things like the Food for Peace program, a lot of the important development program, Ironically, the administration on the one hand says it's very concerned about uh, verification of non-proliferation agreements and so forth. It would have cut the offices doing that um, and for support for other UN agencies, including for UN peacekeeping. It's really a very, very draconian cut to the point that even, uh, not all, but a significant number of Republican senators said that, no, this is dead on arrival. We won't do this, but the administration has not rescinded that proposal. And at the same time, what the State Department has done, essentially, uh, they have 
frozen people in place. They haven't named a lot of people to positions. You have, I saw a figure recently where uh, you have a reduction uh, of about 60% in terms of the levels of very senior career uh, foreign service officers. So you have a drain of expertise and you don't have new people coming in to the ranks because they see a very demoralized State Department. Uh, I would include our diplomacy as part of our, you could call it soft power or smart power. But I think it's a very important point. And once again, the irony in all of this is you have a Secretary of Defense who is a stronger advocate of that, it seems to me, than the current Secretary of State. The Secretary of, St of Defense, when he was a combat commander in Central Command and handling uh, combat operations in Afghanistan and at the time in Iraq, uh, went to testify in front of Congress. This was, I think, in, in 2012, when uh, the, the Republicans in, the, in, in Congress also wanted to cut the State Department budget. And he told them, he said, if you don't fund the State Department, I'm going to have to buy more ammunition. I mean, so he put this very starkly. Of course, he's the Secretary of Defense now. He has a lot of other issues. I don't know what the outcome will be, but I don't think it's a very good signal that an administration itself would seek to tie the hands uh, of its diplomatic corps. And the diplomats in our foreign service are professionals. I, by the way, I was a civil servant. I was not a political appointee. I'm not coming here with a political ax to grind. I've worked for both Democratic and Republican uh, appointees, some very good, some not so good, but in both parties. But the Foreign Service is a resource that if you uh, cut it off at the knees over the space of four years, it's going to take a few years uh, to recover. That's not good for us. Frankly, it's not good for you either. Uh, <clears throat> the conception of uh, the results of the uh, Cold War changed in Russia. Uh, at the first stage, if we look, for instance, at the early 90s, there was a uh, consensus, no, almost consensual view that there was no victors and uh, defeated parties in the uh, Cold War. Everybody was a victor in this process because the transition um, for, to democracy in Russia and the Eastern Bloc, uh, this was a victory for these countries themselves also. But then increasingly uh, the view began, began, began to change and now the powerful, substantial part of the foreign policy establishment in Russia believes that they, <clears throat> we lost the Cold War and we were defeated by the opponents, by the other superpower, and we have in, in, in a kind to take revenge of this, and we should restore our sphere of influence and so on and so forth. And um, uh, I think that uh, nevertheless, uh, the uh, rhetoric of, of Cold War the uh, concept of Cold War can't be applied uh, to uh, today, today's world. The Cold War between uh, Soviet Union and United States uh, was a uh, global multi-dimensional confrontation. Confrontation in ideology, in politics, in uh, economy. It's a local uh, armed confrontation and so on. What we see now, do we see any principal difference between two systems, two poles on the uh, world arena? We don't see this difference. The contemporary Russia does not differ a lot from other countries in politics, ideology, economy, and so on. Uh, the powerful members of the Russian elite has, have property and bank accounts in the West. So how can you expect the real confrontation? It's mostly a rhetoric confrontation for internal use. So uh, for this, the memory of the, cold, the real Cold War can be used, but only on a rhetorical level. That's my point. 
I only say very openly the encouragement for, for, for the diplomats that uh, I think that when the generals are the first one to say whether it's in Afghanistan, Iraq, or, or now the Middle East uh, crisis, that with the weapons you cannot fight the peace, that they could then invest in the system what both the, both the experts of the war and the peace will say that it's most useful. I would like to ask President Hallon, and also I, I sense some soft criticism to the UN system, especially to the Security Council, so that what would you say it is reflecting more or less the situation after the Second World War, but not today's world? Yeah, it was not only soft criticism, very open one, but, but I will say always that when we criticize something, we could say that could we do better? And, and so I think that uh, even it's a lousy system, but, uh, but if we cannot do the better, so better this than something else. Then we without. Yeah. I will now ask if there are questions or comments from the floor, because you have been also waiting. Yes, Professor Alapuro and then Marko Jokisipila and then Ambassador there. It's about... Uh, you spoke about the use of the term Cold War today. What about the use of October Revolution? You, you, I mean, it's obvious that partly it has been replaced by expression Great Russian Revolution, and even the word Russian in, may be used in, in two different ways. Could you develop a little bit of the use of this, this term in today's discussion? Yes, <clears throat> actually, <clears throat> sorry, I think I have two questions. Uh, the first one goes to President Halonen. Uh, what, in your opinion, was the biggest reason for Brexit, and uh, what, if any, lessons should be learned by European Union uh, from, from Brexit? And then to Professor Gusev, as we know, Vladimir Putin is probably one of the most powerful and strongest leaders in, in current world. And uh, I was thinking about the strength of uh, Russian state system. To put it a little bit provocatively, uh, I ask you, can Russian state system survive the exit of Vladimir Putin? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Michael. First of all, I would like to ask you, what is the probability and risk of the war in the region by foreign policy of Mr. Trump, directly to the, his accusation against Iran from the missile point of view and also nuclear agreements, and indirectly supporting the regional countries through supplying them exponentially, the arms, out of the capacity of the region. Thank you very much. I think that uh, the lesson is that you will have the more um, true listening of the people, so that uh, uh, there has been an uh, um, how could I say it, uh, uh, critics concerning the European Union system. And, and I think that uh, the answers, like I try to explain, they are, they are not so simple, not so, so easy, but uh, we should study, of course, the system. We made a certain type of the new constitution of the European Union not very long time ago, and we should see that whether they have a mi uh, mistakes and how it works now. And uh, that's one thing. The second point is that uh, concerning the political leaders, uh, don't take a referendum if you are not taking also the positive, posi possibility of, of uh, no response. Uh, the second, uh, the third one, what you didn't ask, but I say that I was one of those who demanded when we made this new constitution that there, there has to be also the, the paragraph which tells how you can leave the EU. Because <clears throat> as a former lawyer, I thought that if it was even in the Soviet Union, so why cannot it be in the EU if we say that it's just a voluntary, uh, it's, it's a free choice 
like on free choice of the marriage. So it should be also the free choice for the, for the divorce. But I didn't think that it would happen so quickly and without any such kind of the longer, longer thinking that what does it mean? Um, I have a lot of naughty jokes concerning um, UK's uh, um, day after referendum, what was the most favorable question. But I think that it's not idea to be cynical. I think that they use it, it was a democratic decision, and now we should learn it, that it can happen, and then we are afterwards thinking about what, what, what we have done. And, and in that way, let's reason it early enough. This is like a conciliator in the couple thinking of divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Gusev. Uh, the question, if a uh, Russian state would survive the exit of Putin, yes? I understand. Uh, my short answer is yes, certainly. And um, quite a lot of people in Russia, they a bit tired of the same leader who is staying in power for already 17, 17 years. And uh, I think that uh, the, mm, the problem is not Putin. Problem is how our political system functions, and if the if the Russian people would have a chance to elect new leaders according to their own wishes in the process of free competition of various programs and parties, that would not weaken but strengthen Russia. Russia as not a pre-modern empire or something like that, but a modern democratic state. I think the change, uh, uh, the institution of full-fledged democratic system in Russia would, um, would uh, of course, uh, have uh, um, consequences for uh, foreign policy. Uh, but I think these foreign pol these changes would be uh, positive, not negative. We should uh, abandon, from my point of view, the archaic understanding of power. Power means that somebody in the world uh, uh, are afraid of ours. And we can subordinate, yes, we can force other people to do something. It's our high conception. The power, uh, the real influence in foreign policy, which Russia needs, as are all other countries, is the, uh, to serve as an example for other people. To, uh, to be in a country with which other people and nations would like to develop relations. And I hope, as a Russian citizen, that the future of Russia will be this. And uh, the second question, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I, uh, don't I didn't understand exactly what's your point about the Russian revolution. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, now no, it's a, it'll be a little bit different from our, our topic, but uh, I, now there is a growing use in the historical literature, the term the Great Russian Revolution. Uh, in Soviet times, there, there was a conception of two separate revolutions in 1917. First, uh, bourgeois democratic revolution in February, and then a proletarian socialist revolution in October. But now, uh, the historians tend to look at these two uh, revolutions and, uh, as uh, two uh, phases of the same revolutionary process. And they even extend the revolutionary process further. Uh, the uh, conception of the Great Russian Revolution means that revolution began in, 19, in February 1917 and ended in, uh, after the Civil War in uh, 1921, when Bolsheviks consolidated their government in Russia and uh, established control over the whole territory. And this is a, a bit uh, similar to the uh, French Revolution, the Great French Revolution of the um, uh, 18th century, which lasted from uh, 1789 to uh, 1799, about 10 years according to contemporary historiography. 
and uh, there are, the whole period from in Russia from 1917 till 1921 was full of disturbances of struggles of riots uh, uprisings clashes and so on so this is a prolonged revolutionary process which ended with consolidation of power of the new social group the bolshevik elite and uh, uh, on the basis of compromise with the peasantry, which received uh, land and uh, reluctantly supported the new regime. And then, of course, uh, all, uh, all kinds of other historical disturbances <laughs> happened in Russia, uh, including the Stalinist so-called revolution from above, but it's uh, the different uh, historical phenomena. Um, let me try to be very brief uh, on Iran. I actually addressed it in my remarks, but let me expand on it just a little bit. And without going back decades, I'll just go back to when the, uh, it's the JPCOA, the Joint uh, Program Cooperative Approach Agreement. Um, the way things work in the United States, the president consign an executive agreement, which he did, but then Congress has the right to review. Uh, this was not a treaty, but Congress had uh, extensive hearings. They had extensive testimony, which is in the public record, uh, from supporters, from the administration officials who negotiated, from other outside experts, including from those who were critics of the accord. When I listened to and examined the, uh, the record on this. Uh, once again, uh, I was not a participant in this, and I've been out of government now for two years, but it seemed to me that those presenting the arguments on why this was a solid agreement had the advantage. And I was convinced that, uh, as the administration at the time argued, that while no agreement is perfect, that there were many guarantees uh, and that with good verification techniques, the United States and the other countries that negotiated with us would have high confidence that they could detect violations and detect them in a way, and that it served what the U.S. interest was at the time, it still is, by the way, but also a concern shared by the French, by the U.K., and by Germany as well, that there were nuclear activities in Iran, that if unconstrained, would lead uh, to some serious problems, to a nuclear weapons capability that we would find uh, very risky. So I come down on the side of those who think uh, that agreement should be upheld. That does not mean that the United States or France or the UK or Germany uh, aren't interested in other activities that they don't like that Iran conducts. You and U.S. officials and French officials and German officials, etc., would have different opinion on those activities. But the question on this agreement is, should the United States link what Iran does in other areas that we don't like with this agreement? And I come down on the side of those who negotiated the agreement to say all of those other problems would be worse if there were no constraints on the, the nuclear activities and if Iran was on the path to develop a nuclear weapon. So I think the present uh, agreement, you maintain it, as long as you have confidence that Iran is complying with it. The IAEA doesn't seem to have serious concern at this point, neither do our allies. I believe one should work and listen to our allies as well. And at the same time, seek uh, through other means, uh, discussions of activities that the U.S. government or French government or British or Germans think that Iran is conducting that are unhelpful, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Yemen or elsewhere. And I'm sure you have complaints about U.S. policies, but sometimes it's good to separate problems. And uh, in this instance, I would maintain the agreement. Thank you. Now we have three requests for floor, and we shall start with uh, Louis Claire, and then we have Professor Frolov, and the third will be there, 
and after that we will have a round of the panelists if you want to take the floor and then we will conclude because we have had a long day but Louis Yes, so that's again. I'm sorry to hijack the whole the whole thing for a discussion on the on the on, on the American State Department, but, but the um, from what I've read on the on comments and, and op eds on this the situation after that, um, many say that the the end game for the for for the, the the for the American diplomatic apparatus would be that would be a much bigger Pentagon, a much bigger Ministry of Defense, uh, managing things that would actually be in the remit of the State Department. And I, I'm, I'm not very, I don't know, for purely, um, purely uh, maybe theoretical pr points of principles, I'm not very comfortable with that, but my, maybe you want to comment on, on this. And then the second thing that I've got from the discussion is that knowledge of international affairs in the US will relocate in the private sector, which also I think is, is interesting, so you will have globalized companies having extremely uh, extremely sharp international knowledge maybe sharper than the state department on the long term if this the level of cuts and the level of uh, mismanagement of the of the department re remains at this level so if you want to comment on that Thank you very much. Actually, I have two and a half questions. One very short to Professor Song Wei. You mentioned in your PowerPoint that uh, there is one superpower and uh, many other powers. Do I understand right who is this superpower from the point of view of Chinese or? So the other question is to uh, one and a half to Professor Gusev. So I already mentioned the symbolism of the dates. So, uh, Boris Yeltsin came to power in 1991. So, lost it or just retired 1999. Right now, uh, just before or just during his time, the bulk of population of the Soviet Union was against the Soviet Union. So, right now, the moods have been changed. So right now about, the, if I'm not mistaken, about 75% uh, about about of Russians are thinking about uh, the Soviet Union like an um, El Dorado or something like that. And the question is, what wrong was with the policy of uh, President Yeltsin? Why the moods of the Russian people have been changed so greatly just uh, only in eight years. And uh, the half of the question, so you mentioned that uh, this period was the period of revolution. So if we are speaking about the uh, returning to the Soviet Union, is it right now, is it the time of counter-revolution? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chairman, my name is Dr. Paul. I'm from this university and also from, from Hanken. And I have a, a comment. The topic of this theme is changing global power and balance. And what I read, what I read from, the, from the speakers is that the international regime that was built up after the Second World War, the United Nations, the European Union, and various agreements that the United States has participated in, in, the, in, in, in Asia, but also in North America. This whole regime system is breaking up and, and losing credibility. If we think in the European Union, we have the, the independence movement of, of, of Catalonia, we have the, the elections in Verona and Lombardy, we have the problems with Poland and some other of the so-called new member states. So we see a disintegration of this uh, of this uh, global environment that has secured peace, at least in Europe, for, for, for since the Second World War. And, uh, and I have a feeling that we are going into a very hard environment, a very concrete environment where, where, where this Morgenthau type of thinking, where, where hard power decides. And we are really seeing a situation where, of course, the three major powers that are here at the table Will 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 force themselves 
and, and try to find their own areas of interest, both globally and, and regionally. And this will naturally affect small countries like, like Finland. And, and personally, I'm quite worried that even if Finland makes agreements with the other, other Nordic countries and, and, and with the European Union and closer to NATO and so on, this, this puts the small countries in a situation where they will be dictated dictated what they should do or not do at a later stage. And I would like to have some comments on, on this, this structural disintegration of the security system of, that was created after the Second World War and on the role of the small countries that are really the objects and not the subjects of, 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 of big country policies. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so we use one superpower, many powers, to describe the existing international structure. Uh, in 2016, China's GDP is only about 60% 60, 60 of, uh, of the United States. So we still have great power gap with the hegemon. Uh, China is not a contender for hegemony, uh, according to the power transition theory. Uh, and uh, besides China, Japan, Germany, and many other countries are also great powers uh, in the system. Uh, and I think in the near future, this structure won't change greatly. So uh, basically, I don't think there is a very emergent risk between China and the United States. Uh, China and the United States may, might have strategic competition with each other on the long run, but uh, there are also many, many uh, favorable factors for the stability between China and the United States. Uh, both of us are nuclear powers. We are highly interdependent, and we are separated by the Pacific Ocean. Yes, uh, just now Mr. Liu has mentioned the South China Sea uh, uh, issue. Yes, it's not impossible that China and the United States might conflict in this area, but I think the possibility is very low South China Sea issue is not, has nothing to do with the regional order. Uh, for, chi for Chinese, actually, I don't think it's very meaningful to establish those islands or reefs. And we are strong supporters of the free trade system. We strongly support the freedom of navigation and uh, overflight. So, on the on the regional order in East Asia, I don't think China and the United States have very big differences. We all support uh, openness and freedom. Uh, why China is, uh, has become becoming uh, tougher on the territorial issues, I think to a great extent is the leadership is responding to domestic requirements because now we are, we, we are we're rising up. So, may, so many people are requiring the leadership to have a, a, a stronger position on territorial issues. But uh, in reality, I don't think uh, this, this issue will lead to the direct conflict between China and uh, the United States, and I also agree with the president. So China can be very constructive in international organizations. Um, maybe I'm a, a little bit pessimistic, but I, I support the con constructive side of today's Chinese foreign policy. Uh, we can pay attention to the cost and benefit, but we, yes, we should support the multilateral institutions 
uh, especially in the climate change, such as climate change institutions, we can use this uh, pr process to upgrade our domestic economic structure. It can be external pressure. So, it, so when China are supporting the multilateral process, it's also favorable to Chinese national interests. Okay, that's all. If I continue, I do hope so that you can also solve the, your domestic problems because if we think the size of China and if you would have an serious domestic problems, so um, it would have also the problem of many others. Um, so that's, that's, that's very, very shortly. And coming to the question of, uh, of international structure, uh, yes, it is old, old structure, and it's not quite fitting to this uh, modern world of the internet and, and all that, the system which is extremely developed, but also very fragile, uh, which is very easy to harm uh, and difficult to, to govern. And, and that's why I think that uh, the certain term what I don't like, but, but what is quite true, this uh, the time and the uncertainty uh, will continue. And, and I don't find any such kind of the solution that the leaders would decide it. I do hope so, very strongly committed leaders, because they could help the process. Uh, and, and that's what I think is the historical resp responsibility. But uh, I think also that we have to see also much larger responsibility and to see that we, we have start from the beginning with all the citizens, not only the younger generation, but also the other ones, to see that how they read news, how they read internet, and, and be, be very, how could I say, strongly committed to that. It, it looks very, very difficult, but I don't see any other, other answer. And uh, what I think that what I, I have become more optimistic is also that more and more people seem to take it also personally. They see the situation personally, and, and in, in that way, uh, there are the possibilities. But for instance, that's kind of the news we, we have had on violence in our own country, even concerning the small children and so on. I think that uh, there are a lot of such kind of things what we have not wanted to see, but what we should step by step try to, try to help. So, uh, um, yeah, we human beings, we are quite difficult, but not impossible. Okay. So the, maybe my final comment will be a bit of pushback on the on the uh, disintegration of the EU. We are not. I don't think we are quite there yet. Uh, there's there's a, there's still a lot. I mean, the EU is a mess. It's always been a mess. The communities were a mess. Uh, the EEC was a mess, and the EU now is a mess. It's what you get when you get and twenty. The life is a mess. <laughs> It's, it's what you get when you, when you put 27 countries in the same. Everybody has its own susceptibilities, its own interests, and you have to make something out of that. So the, I, I, I don't see quite it as a, as a process of disintegration, but more as a process of very slow, uh, very slow change, and again, this word of, of uncertainty. Uh, there's certainly crisis in uh, crisis, economic, uh, social, uh, intellectual, political crisis in several member states of the European Union. And I would say that uh, uh, France, for example, is a, is, is a very good example of that. You have a, a political crisis, a complete reshuffling of all the, the political parties, uh, a, a, a political candidate coming out of nowhere, etc., etc. So you have plenty of that going on. But I wouldn't call that disintegration so much as a, a slow process of change. We don't see exactly where this is going, but that doesn't mean that it's going peer chef basically. So we, I, I would, I would push back just for the sake of, of arguing with you. Uh, I would push back against this idea of a complete disintegration of the EU. I think there's still quite a lot, a lot going on before the EU uh, completely disintegrates. Um, uh, let me just touch on two or three topics, and that, that'll be my fi final comment. Just to come back to this question of uh, the balance, for example, between defense and state in, in the U.S., between military or hard power, if you want, and, 
and soft power. I'll just remind you, people count in, in all of this battle. Uh, Robert Gates replaced under the George W. Bush administration um, Don Rumsfeld. Within the first year, Robert Gates is not a, a dove. Robert Gates has a very uh, distinguished, but uh, I would say uh, sometimes hard line uh, past in American national security circles. But when he became the Secretary of Defense, still fighting uh, where the U.S. was very, very heavily involved in Afghanistan and uh, in Iraq, he gave a speech on how the United States really needed to invest much more in the Agency for International Development, in the State Department. This was in the George W. Bush administration. He was held on, although he was personally a Republican, he was held on as the Secretary of Defense for a few years during the first Obama administration and had a very good relationship with then Secretary of State Clinton and they would actually go and testify together about the importance of how diplomacy uh, helps prevent wars and is necessary as well to stabilize uh, post-conflict situations. Uh, it's very ironic that, at least according to many press accounts, it was Robert Gates who suggested to Donald Trump, who was having a hard time finding uh, a qualified uh, Secretary of State, that he look at Rex Tillerson of ExxonMobil, who ended up being the Secretary of State at the recommendation of Robert Gates, who at least acquiesced and says publicly that he supports this proposal to cut the State Department by 30%. And I think it was just last week that Robert Gates wrote an, another op-ed in the Washington Post or New York Times. I'd have to go back and check. But I think once again saying, hey, we need uh, diplomacy in the United States that works. So, um, which comes to my, my last point. Uh, the question that was referred to here about, uh, I'm sorry, uh, by Dr. Paul, is a question about what is the Western liberal, the, the Western uh, kind of liberal world order, the view that countries could become more democratic over time, that we'd become more institutionally linked, and, and uh, what's happened to that vision. And I think it is under stress, but it's under stress a lot because we don't have our domestic house in order. And, uh, as I said, in my opinion, what we've seen in the United States is an anomaly, and I think it will, could be reversed uh, in, re uh, in elections in the not-too-distant future. Uh, but we have to get our domestic house in order, and that's the way we conduct our politics. And I'm afraid, as I said in my remarks, that in some countries from time to time we're losing the sense of tolerance, of compromise, that politics is really a high art and should not be a low art. It's not reality TV. It's not a game show, uh, and we all have to get that. My final point is, actually, I'm going to offer a point on the EU. I know coming from an American, this may surprise you a little bit, but I'll mention to you, my father was French, uh, born in Paris, grew up, served in the French army in the 1930s. He was on the Maginot Line. My mother was born in the United States, but of European parents. Um, but um, a few years ago, I had, I was, had an assignment in Europe, and I was living in Switzerland, and had to go pick up my car, which was delivered to Brussels. And uh, I went and picked up the car, and I drove back. I wasn't stopped at one border. So I crossed the border into Luxembourg, crossed the border, eventually into France. And then what struck me, particularly, was crossing the border in Strasbourg, from Strasbourg to Kiel, there was not even a police post there. And I thought, particularly with my own uh, father's background, with my family's background, here is an area that had fought three bloody wars in 100 years, and now there's not a bloody policeman to stop you from going over there. And the French and the Germans don't agree, we know, on a lot of issues, but the idea of going to war against each other no longer exists in their psyche. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. I think even George Marshall played a role, but certainly the EU has helped a lot. And I think these things take time, and they take people. 
So I hear a lot about the big trends here and the big trends. That's all very interesting and it's very important. But it takes the right people with the political courage and the vision to avoid war and to, to create a cooperative society. And I think the EU has contributed a lot to that. And I don't think it's going to break up. Uh, and I certainly hope that it can prosper more in the future. Uh, answering Professor Frolov's question about uh, comparison between the uh, situation with the breakdown of the USSR and the uh, revolution, previous revolution. Uh, as I said in my presentation, I consider the um, history of the 20th century in Russia as a history of the uh, long and fundamental uh, revolutionary process. Uh, the re modernization revolution, which first manifested itself in 1905, then in Great Russian Revolution, and then in the events of um, uh, late 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, because uh, in all these revolutions, people were motivated basically by the same uh, aims uh, and uh, motives. They f fought against uh, political uh, uh, authoritarianism, and they fought against uh, social and economic inequality. And the tasks of revolutions, they were not fully solved in all these three phases. And the revolution is going to develop until these tasks are solved. And um, what, what happened in the 90s? Uh, Professor Frolov uh, correctly said that uh, the um, people got disillusioned, dissatisfied with the results of the uh, events uh, which um, led to the breakdown of the USSR. They wanted political freedom, democracy, equality, the expropriation of nomenclatura, no new oligarchy, and so on. What, they, what did they receive? They received profound crisis, economic impoverishment, and consolidation of the new oligarchy. Yes, uh, and, Yeltsin, and even on the political level, Yeltsin's regime itself was becoming more and more authoritarian to the end of the 1990s. So I think this can be compared with the Termidorian phase of the revolution. And after Termidorian phase, comes the Bonapartist phase. It happened in France, and I think it happened in Russia. And uh, Yeltsin just gave power to Putin, and we see the uh, powerful ruler who concentrates all powers and authorities in his hands and wants to rebuild the greatness of Russia. Quite a typical Bonapartist uh, system. But I think that uh, the, mm, this is not an end of the story for Russia, because the, I, I, I am sure that the history tells us that development will continue until the tasks of modernization are solved. And I believe that Russia will arrive at the stage of full political democracy because this is necessitated by its economic system and social structure. It can take more time. It can take uh, the same period as in France, for instance, where the French Revolution in the broad sense of the world lasted more than 100 years, from uh, 19th century till the, uh, 1971. So maybe Russian Revolution will, will uh, develop the same long period. But it must solve its tasks, and I think it will be done. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It is time to conclude this conference. I am very grateful for all of you who have participated as speakers, as organizers, as supporters. Many embassies have also contributed to this event. We are very glad that we have, during one day, very long day, been able to go through a history and relations during 100 years. And I think that this long time frame has also opened us many windows 
also so that we, we can see that many things have changed, but many things have not changed during that, so that the, the human beings are similar and many of the processes and ways to think are also similar, if not quite the same. But thank you very much for coming here on behalf of all the organizing organizations we have now concluded this conference. Thank you.